in the cloud. There we go. Welcome to Understanding Space Through a Cybersecurity Lens. I'm Jerry Sellers. And um, a little bit about me. So I did uh, 20 years in the Air Force, uh, mainly space stuff. I worked space shuttle mission control back in the day. I uh, worked about 14 different shuttle flights, including on console for the Challenger accident, and then worked uh, return to flight after that. So if you saw the movie Apollo 13, anybody, I, I actually worked for Gene Kranz back in the day. Um, then did a bunch of other stuff in the Air Force, all space related. I uh, retired from the Air Force in 2004. And then I've uh, been with our small company, TSDI. We do training and uh, workforce development and system engineering consulting kind of all over the industry. So um, I'm also uh, adjunct at, at Stevens Institute of Technology and at Georgetown, do some graduate courses with them. And I'm an agile guy, so I teach agile uh, around, the, around, the, around the industry a bit too. I'm here today with uh, two other folks helping me out. So I'll turn first over to Terry. Terry, if you want to say a few words about yourself. Hi there, I am Terry Johnson and I am the chair of the Computer Networking and Cyber Department at Pikes Peak Community College, located here in Colorado Springs. I started in IT uh, over 20 years ago, really specializing in computer networking and then securing those computer networks starting out with uh, the, um, like Deloitte and Anderson, two of the uh, big five or whatever they're called now, tax and audit firms. And then I realized that I really have this love for education and have served on um, as both faculty and staff in uh, K-12 and higher ed. Like uh, when I have free time, I really like to spend it on beaches. So you're, uh, I'm, and I'm coming to you from Colorado, and, and actually all of us are in Colorado. So she's at a virtual beach back there. But, yeah. uh, and then uh, help today too by Jason. And Jason, you want to say a quick word about yourself? Um, yes, I am a high school student. I'm um, interested in computer science and uh, cybersecurity. I am on the Robox team and I've participated in a number of local uh, coding competitions and I'm just going to be helping out here. So he's getting a little experience rubbing shoulders virtually with uh, the, with uh, folks in the cyber community. So this is good practice for him today. So I uh, said so our company is TSTI. So we do training consulting around the industry. We like to say we have a front row seat. Uh, to the industry, we get to see what kind of challenges everybody has at NASA, ESA, DoD, industry. Uh, we work on a lot of support, a lot of textbook development work, and and we our company does on-site training back when you could do that. Uh, we've kind of pivoted 100% virtual training since COVID. Uh, we also do coaching and integrated programs, and then we do other consulting, uh, especially in model-based system engineering, is a very growing area uh, for us. So um, I saw one question in there in the chat about uh, reusable rockets. Let's hold that question. That's a good one to bring up when we get to the, uh, to the break. So if you got specific questions about the material, I'll probably handle it that right then. If it's a good question, but I think we it might deserve a, a deeper answer, I might wait until the break. So that if you're okay with that, that's how we'll proceed. Um, so here's our overview of what we're going to try to do this afternoon. I'm going to start with big picture. We want to know the context for space. And that context is also the context in which uh, cybersecurity has to uh, occur with respect to space. So we'll tackle that and we'll look at this thing we call the space mission architecture and how all the puzzle pieces that have to go together to make a space mission be um, successful. We'll then look at various opportunities. So opportun opportunities for uh, people to do necessarily and possibly nefarious things. And, we'll, and with respect to that, we'll look at orbital mechanics and mission operations. So we'll focus on those two, uh, if you will, uh, threat surfaces. And then we'll look at specific threats having to do with the natural environment of space and the man-made environment. And we're, we're gonna see the natural environment is pretty darn nasty. Um, so it's hard enough to work in space, let alone you just throw humans on there to try to do bad things. Um, but we'll try to understand both of those potential threat areas. And then we'll end up this afternoon looking at vulnerabilities and we'll look at two key vulnerabilities, one being RF links, so the RF systems, radio frequency systems shown there in that cartoon as uplinks, downlinks. These are the, the pipes that carry the data that we use in missions. And then we'll talk a bit about the space data architectures 
that we use in ground and onboard systems. So here's our objective. Oh, sorry. First, first of all, this course is based around this textbook. So there's a textbook called Understanding Space, um, and it's available through that website. Um, this is part of the Space Technology series. I think there's roughly up to 30 books now in that series that tackle all kinds of different space subjects. So if you're interested in pretty much anything to do in space, there's a textbook probably for it. But this is the introductory book, and a lot of the material here, uh, the images came out of that book. So if you're interested in that, you can um, try to get a copy of that. Um, so here's our objectives for the afternoon. We're going to start by trying to build some core space knowledge. So we're basically launching you on a trajectory here. Um, where we're going to start by you know, laying the foundation of the launch pad with our core space knowledge, what is the space mission architecture, and that kind of thing. Um, and then we'll look at how we build upon that to understand the basic capabilities and trade-offs and limitations as they apply specifically to the cybersecurity domain. Um, we're going to focus on mechan orbital mechanics and the opportunities or lack thereof that that creates for getting access to space systems. And then look at the operational architectures as well and see how that can constrain access. And as I said, we'll focus on the natural and human-made uh, threats that can be out there, especially the natural ones, and, where the, and what kind of vulnerabilities that com comes out from there as we look at things like uh, radio frequency links and the uh, data architecture. Um, so uh, somebody's asked for the recording. Now, I think we'll be posting that recording. I just sent the morning recording off to the organizers. So they're going to put that on Discord somewhere. I don't know where they put that. Uh, but uh, if you, um, my, uh, did I put my email? Yes, I guess I'm, yeah, no, I didn't, uh, yeah, I, I put my email address. So if, um, if anything comes up in this course or afterwards, uh, please feel free to reach out to me if you can't find the recording or whatever, I can, I can get it for you. So please feel free to, to track us down if you, if you need to. Um, so here's our uh, uh, agenda. We're an afternoon session, day one over there on the left. So we're just getting started. And you see the course is broken into kind of half hour segments. So we'll tackle a, a subject for about a half an hour. And then I've got some poll questions that I'll ask you just to kind of see if you've been paying attention. And also gives us a chance to discuss some of the topics a little deeper. Um, we'll have time for a little stretch break in there. And also we can tackle any any sort of uh, uh, other questions that you might come up with that are a little off topic, but I wanted to build in some time to, to talk about those somewhat off topic questions. We had some great questions this morning about slingshot trajectories and other stuff. So uh, again, kind of any questions, fair game uh, here. So feel free to, to come up with stuff and we, we've got time built in to, to do that. So we'll, we'll hit each section for roughly about a half hour, take a poll, have a short break, and then we'll uh, get right back at it. And then you want to say, save up some energy for the very end because then we're going to have a little cybersecurity challenge for all of you. So I'm going to present you with a scenario and you're going to have to think through what you do to respond to that uh, potential cybersecurity scenario. So uh, get ready for that. That's coming here at the end of the afternoon. So it should be pretty action packed, hopefully a fun afternoon for you. So let's start with a context. So I'm a big picture guy. I like to think about, okay, what, you know, how does this, uh, how, let me show you the, you know, I can't put together the pieces of the puzzle until you show me the, the picture on the front of the box. Okay, so this is the picture on the front of the box of what the puzzle is going to look like. And that puzzle has these various key pieces that we want to look at. We call that, we put that whole puzzle together, we call it the space mission architecture, which includes orbits and trajectories, spacecraft, launch vehicles, operations, and at the core there, we have the mission itself. So we want to know how all those pieces go together. And that's what we're going to start by tackling. And to do that, we want to first understand, well, why, you know, because we're going to look at the mission, why do we go to space at all? You know, what are the reasons that we would even bother spending all this money, time, effort, risking people's lives to go to space? And space, it turns out, is a pretty big industry. I think as, as of last year, the latest numbers I saw, space is a $420 billion industry. I mean, it rivals, uh, uh, it rivals the airline industry in terms of size. So it's a pretty big industry. So where, where's all this money coming from? Why are people even making money in space? Why do we go to the time and trouble to go to space? So we list here what we call is space imperatives, the, the unique aspects about space that make us want to go there. And so we have global perspective, 
clear view of the heavens, free fall environment, resources, and the final frontier. So of those, um, of those reasons, of those five reasons we might go to space, which do you think is the single most important? The reason, that, the reason that we most often go to space and the reason most people make money in space. Who wants to guess which of those five are the most important? Go ahead, you just put it in the chat or you can shout out. I'd say the uh, global perspective. You can see the whole world. Absolutely. Whole world. Yeah, you nailed it. Um, so I live in Colorado, so I like to tell people the reason we go to space is to get high. Um, that's the main reason we go to space, because it's higher. By being higher, we can see more stuff. Right? The more I can see, the better I can understand what's going on. Um, if we could simply build a tall tower and look down, we'd probably prefer to do that. But we can't build a tower quite that tall, although I have some colleagues trying to build a space elevator, but that's another discussion. But um, but uh, by being being high, we can see more, right? And the more I can see, the more I can understand what's going on. It turns out back in the back in the 50s, 1957, when the Russians launched Sputnik, they actually did us a favor. Um, they um, they they established the precedent, international law, that you can overfly any country from space. Now you can't overfly any country in the air. You can't just get in an airplane and go fly over Canada. They wouldn't like that. Um, but you can overfly Canada from space. Um, there, that's international law. That's an okay thing to do. Um, so that that established space is sort of open sky in terms of the ability to go over and overfly anything that's out there. Um, so that was Sputnik 1, and then later on they flew a couple other missions. And then anybody know uh, the first animal to fly in space? The Russians flew the first animal in space. Yeah, it was a dog. The dog was named Laika. Anybody remember Laika? So Laika, Laika was a dog that flew in space. And of course, we didn't know much about Laika but, you know, during the Soviet times. But after the fall of the Soviet Union, information came out about Laika. And it turns out Laika was not any ordinary dog. They scoured the entire Soviet Union to find a special dog because they wanted to have a talking dog because they couldn't have an air to ground mic. So they, they needed a talking dog. So Laika was a talking dog. And when Laika came down to land, they were, she was supposed to land on the land, but you know, their early times, her guidance wasn't that accurate. So she ended up landing in the, in the, in the sea. And it was a stormy night and a little capsule got kind of tossed around and they finally got the capsule up on the beach and they opened up the hatch and Laika came trotting down. They said, Laika, how was the trip? And she said, rough. So yeah, talking dog, Laika. But so actually that's a lie, Laika couldn't talk. Actually Laika unfortunately burned up on reentry which is why the Russians say they invented the hot dog. So anyway, but um, there we go. Um, so, uh, but I digress. So we get up there to be high, we get up there to see what's going on. And that's the most important reason. These other reasons are cool too, but uh, in terms of making money, uh, being high is where it's about. So while we're up there, we can do some cool things. So being high, we, one of the most important things we can do is provide communication. So Arthur Clark came up with this idea, Arthur, he's a science fiction writer, I came up with this idea in the 40s, actually, somebody else came up with it, but he's popular for, for stating it, is that if I could put a satellite that two people could see on opposite sides of the earth, and they can both see the satellite, then we could talk through that satellite. So we can relay information through that satellite. That special orbit we can use to do that is called geostationary orbit. We'll talk about that here in a little bit, in a little while. Um, and if you look at the bottom picture there, you can see out at the, this is not quite the scale, the geostationary orbit is pretty popular. There's roughly 400 active satellites up there in geostationary orbit, mostly doing communication. And they're not really stacked up like little BBs there. Uh, that's just showing how many are in a given slot. The slots are pretty big. It's about a one degree slot, roughly uh, 360 degrees, if you will, around the earth and roughly one degree slots. Um, so there can be more than one satellite in a slot, uh, but it's a very popular place to be. If you have the, you know, if you, if you own a slot, if you have license to use a slot, um, that's literally money in the bank. Um, so it's like owning beachfront property because they're not making any more of it. So very popular place to, to operate from in space. Um, you can kind of see where the, the popular places are. You can see there's a lot kind of over in Europe. There's a lot over the North America, a lot over Asia, not so much over the middle of the Pacific. 
Um, so that's that's where most of the money being made in space today is, is in geostationary calm. Um, the other big area that's not so much a money maker, although people do make money off GPS, but is certainly an enabler for the global economy is navigation and really position navigation and timing global you know uh, geospatial navigation services um, and of course the most most popular there is gps the global positioning system uh, operated by uh, the air force uh, now space force and then of course there's glonass there's the the chinese uh, uh, beidou system and there's galileo the new european system so there's more and more systems coming available uh, which is good. It gives us some backup because if you think about it, the entire global economy depends on this capability for position navigation and timing. Uh, if you were to take out that capability, the world economy would be worse shape than it is right now. Uh, so really bad. You know, ATMs wouldn't work. Um, you wouldn't be able to use a lot of global communication. And of course, you know, people would get lost. So all of this is key. So it's and, and the ability to do GPS is provided by the fact that we can put satellites in a high orbit and standing on Earth, I can see at least four satellites at any one time. Four tends, it turns out to be the magic number I need to solve the problem. So I can see four satellites at once. Usually I, I can see more than that. I can get that by having those satellites up there in a very high orbit. So any place on Earth, you can always see at least four satellites. So that, that's simply an advantage of being up there high. And I, here on Earth, I can access those satellites uh, quite easily, and now I have the ability to do my navigation. So, so that that high ground again, that global perspective, is being leveraged by uh, GPS and other navigation systems. And of course, the other thing we can do by being up there is we can look down. We can look down and take pictures of what's happening on Earth. So that's our what we broadly call remote sensing kind of missions. And and of course, obvious one would be something like the nightly weather report. You we just had a hurricane pass off the coast of Florida. So you probably saw some of the images from that all came from uh, satellites. We have satellites in geostationary orbit and in low earth orbit that monitor the weather. And then we have all, all kinds of satellites that do imaging. Planet Labs has a whole number of satellites they do for daily imaging of the earth. And you can do low resolution, high resolution. Uh, of course, the military does very high resolution imagery, spy satellite type things. Um, we have missions like uh, uh, that, that do just environmental monitoring that will look for uh, ozone monitoring and things like that. Landsat is a long-term mission that uh, has been flown now for gosh, going on 40 years that they've been monitoring Earth's environment for that long. So nice longitudinal data in terms of behavior. And these spy satellites all go back to the early days. So one of the very first, well, the first uh, military satellite we tried to build was to do uh, was spy satellites. And that was a mission called Corona, not to be confused with the beer or the virus, but the Corona mission uh, was uh, stood up by the National Reconnaissance Office at the time. That was its job was to go do that. And, uh, and to give you an idea of the priority, their, their 13th flight was successful. They had 12 consecutive failures and still got funding uh, to keep going. Um, and they launched these satellites up in space. This is now the early 60s. How did they get the pictures down? Anybody know how they got the pictures? Oh, down? Waves. <laughs> What's that? No, they, wouldn't they drop like film rolls down yes. and you know, land? Yes. yes, they they ejected the film rolls from the satellite. The satellite, the film rolls entered the they had containers, obviously entered the atmosphere, and then they popped a parachute, and then they would snatch them out of the air, and then they would send them to a place called Photomat, and you'd get your pictures back in a couple of weeks, right? That was the Instagram of the day, right? That's when we use this stuff called film. Um, yeah, hard to believe that they actually literally launched rolls of film and then parachuted the rolls of film down from outer space. I mean, it's hard to hard to imagine, uh, but that's what they did. Uh, it wasn't until the 70s that uh, they went to all digital. So, I mean, you can pretty much, uh, you know, thank uh, spy satellites for the digital capability, digital camera capability you have on your cell phone today. An ability to develop the CCDs and that sort of technology came and was pushed by um, remote sensing kind of missions. So again, why there? Why can we do this? Because we're above the Earth, because we're high, because we can see what's going on. Um, so let's explore that architecture now a little bit deeper. Now that we understand why we're going to space, and the first part of our architecture is why is the mission, right? And so in 1961. 
President Kennedy gave a very famous speech about going to the moon. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. So that, in that case, uh, Kennedy outlined a very simple uh, mission, right? And at least simple in terms of articulating it, right? Land a man in the moon, turn him safely to the earth, end of the decade. Three, three goals and objectives right there. Um, so what we want to know about any mission is, first of all, what need are we addressing? Here was the need to, you know, beat the Russians. Um, but then what are the goals and objectives we're trying to accomplish? And how do we plan to go about accomplishing that? We call that the concept of operations. So we want to know all those things to give us the, an idea of the, of the why. Once we know the why, we can figure out the how. And the how usually starts with a spacecraft. So a spacecraft is a satellite in orbit. And we'll talk about orbits a bit later here. And that satellite's going to do a job. And that, that satellite, we can break into two parts. We call it the payload and the bus. So the payload is the part that's doing the mission. It's taking the pictures. It's sending the... The, the, it's relaying the HBO signal, whatever it is its mission is doing. And then the bus is there to support the payload. So just like our little cartoon in the bottom there, the button, you know, the school bus's job is to get the payload, the kids, to school. Uh, so that, that payload, we got a live mic there. Um, that payload then is getting transported by the bus. And so the bus has to have what? It has to have structure has to have uh, you know, propulsion, it has to have a radio, air conditioning, all the things to keep the payload happy. And that's what we're doing in any, uh, in any mission, right? We have the, the bus carrying the payload, the payload's doing the, the mission, the bus is, is, uh, is carrying the payload. And we typically will often, sometimes we'll actually split up the operations with that. There, there's, a, there's a DOD mission where the Army operates the payload and the Air Force, I guess now Space Force operates the bus and, and that's a because it's a big mission and it's a, it's a lot to manage so they split that between two organizations so and and some science missions may have a dozen different payloads and so you have may have multiple payload operators uh, for different uh, parts of that so that's kind of how we want to think about our, our mission we have our mission at the center of our spacecraft that's doing the job we have the payload that's actually doing the interaction taking the pictures the bus supporting the payload and then we, once we're up there, the, the spacecraft has to operate from an orbit. And as we're going to see, we can think about an orbit like a big racetrack. And so once I get into that racetrack, I'm going to be going around and around the Earth all day long. And then I'm going to look down. Um, and when I look down, I'm going to see some amount of the Earth. How much I see depends on how high I am, right? The higher I am, the more the Earth I can see. Um, as I look down, then that cone that you see in that cartoon on the bottom, that cone has a field of regard. The field of regard is everything I potentially can see. And then the field of view is what I actually do see when I say point my camera. I've got an animation of that coming up a little bit later. Um, and then that swath, you see that, that, that line across there, that tells you how much of the earth I can see as I'm kind of going around the earth. So that swath, think about mowing a lawn, right? I'm, I'm mowing a swath across the earth. And depending on how high I am and depending on some other factors of my mission, that'll tell you how wide a swath I can cut. And if I cut a wide swath, then maybe I don't need to orbit the Earth very many times to see everything. And if I have a narrow swath, I may have to orbit the Earth quite a few times before I see everything. And so that's going to be a big trade-off for us in terms of access to information on the ground and access from the ground to the satellite, as we're going to see. We'll look at a thing called ground tracks and see why that's important. The other piece of the problem is getting to space. So here's our launch of the Atlas V launch of the NASA Cyrus Rex mission uh, from a couple of years ago. So you got a big old Atlas V rocket, and um, liquid oxygen, kerosene engines on the first stage there, RD-180 engines, and that's going to take you 
into orbit, into that orbit we just talked about. Um, rockets are broken into stages, and that's because of the just inherent limitations of the rocket technology we have today. Um, in this case, their stage is not recoverable. If I'd shown you a Falcon 9, it should probably show you recovering that first stage. Um, it's also LOX kerosene, it turns out. But um, that's how I'm going to get to orbit. And we're going to see how much energy that launch vehicle has to deliver for me to get into orbit. Turns out that's quite a bit. Once I'm up there, now I can start doing my mission. And the main reason I'm going to space, I'm up there, I'm high, I'm looking down at the Earth, I'm up there either creating data or moving data, right? So the whole name of the game in the space business is about ones and zeros going from one point to another, right? How those ones and zeros get around are on all these links that we're going to talk about. So that's that, architect, that's that uh, communication architecture we show there at the top. So all of mission operations is about people, processes, and things for doing the job. So we've got a lot of, got a, thing, a lot of things, a lot of infrastructure, manufacturing, launch capabilities, um, communication networks. And then I have all the people, the mission management and operations that are actually running the mission. So I have a classic picture down there at the bottom. That's the Apollo 13 mission after they successfully got the astronauts back uh, from their harrowing experience. You see, you know, dozens of people there just in the front room, but you know, the, you know, a large mission like uh, human space flight, International Space Station, literally has thousands of people around the world supporting that. Now, if I have a little CubeSat mission, maybe I only have a dozen or so people supporting that, uh, but still you've got people, right? And people, processes, and things that we need to, to run the mission. Then finally, we have system engineering and project management to pull it all together. So system engineering is our process of turning a need into a capability. Uh, system engineering is about balancing cost schedule performance along with risk to deliver our mission successfully. And then we have our project management to lead, lead the team and ultimately try to deliver the, the program on cost, on schedule, on budget with, with acceptable, uh, acceptable risk. And then supporting all that, and especially as, as we kind of emerge into this area of cyberspace um, and cybersecurity for space, is we have an organization uh, that we can call out here called the Information Sharing and Analysis Center, the ISAC, uh, started just a, a year or so ago, to look at trying to pull together some of these threats and opportunities in, in uh, cyberspace. So they, they work with industry and they work with government, focusing on three key areas of supply chain, safety, business systems, and overall missions to try to make sure that uh, we're stay keep keep the community aware of what the cybersecurity issues uh, could be. So there's our big picture context. I wanted to understand why we go to space for that global perspective. What kinds of missions we do up there, especially communication, remote sensing, and navigation. When you don't want to understand what we mean by that space mission architecture that includes the mission itself, the the, the spacecraft, the orbit the launch vehicle, the mission operation systems as well. So from a cybersecurity standpoint, what we'd like you to take away here is an understanding and appreciation for how important space is to the global economy. And not only is it a, a big industry just by itself and nearly half a billion, half a trillion dollars, um, but it's integral to pretty much everything. So from cell phones to power grids, to GPS, to commercial transportation, and simply knowing where you are and commercial and financial markets, we depend, we the, we the world depend on space. And of course, the more you depend on something, the more vulnerable it can potentially be. And that's the vulnerability we want you to be aware of. And that because, because of that, space is becoming a larger attack vector that we have to focus on. And then finally, just be aware of the space ISAC and what that collaborative groups like that can help uh, do for us. All right, um, there was a good question about reusable rockets. I want to get to in here in a second. Uh, but um, any specific questions about what we just covered in terms of big picture? <clears throat> See, we ended up with a pretty healthy crowd, so that's great. Um, any questions that came out from what we covered? Uh, yeah, I think I, I have a question. So um, I am French, so I have a French accent. So I hope you will uh, you will be able to understand me. Um, no the thing is that I have to, to go on another. So it was really inter interesting and thank you so much. And uh, I have to go on another uh, talk. 
but can I have your email address? Because I, I would like to ask you some questions, but I need to leave now. So is it possible that you write it in the chat maybe? Yeah, it was in the slides, but I just put there too. I didn't. Uh, okay, yeah. well, that's really nice. Thank you so much. And uh, I will need to leave uh, Zoom really yeah. soon. Thank well, you. we'll be doing it again tomorrow and Sunday morning. So if you want to drop back, can you sit with me? Are we at what time? Because uh, tomorrow, time? tomorrow's at 9 and at uh, oh, okay. one thirty. Mm -hmm. OK. I didn't and then another that. one on Sunday at 9 AM. Yep. OK. Mm. It was not written on the. Yep. I'm, I'm not sure. Is, is it written on the um, uh, DEF CON uh, schedule website with Aerospace Village? I'm not sure. I didn't see it. It, it should be. And Matt, you, uh, Matt should be able to answer that. Yep, but it is. All it. And if you check in the uh, Discord, there's an Understanding Space uh, Discord channel. Uh, schedule's okay. in there as well. Okay. That's okay. great. Thank you. Okay. You bet. Any other specific questions from what we covered? All right, I'm going to give you the poll. So let's uh, watch the poll there. So take a couple of minutes to answer the poll, and uh, we will start back up in about 10 minutes. So this gives you a chance to answer the poll, and then we'll cover the poll, and then we'll pick right back up there, and we're going to hit uh, opportunities. So buckle up. We're going to talk about orbital mechanics when we get back. So go ahead and take the poll, take, take a stretch break if you need it, and then we'll dive into orbital mechanics here in a minute. And do your best with the poll questions. And then if there's any other questions you have from what we've covered so far, or if there's something you want to make sure I do cover, uh, please put that in chat. All right, we got pretty good participation in the chat there or in the poll. Give everybody another minute or two and then we'll go through the poll and see if we have any other questions and then we'll pick up from there.
All right, let's see how we did. I'll end the poll here and share the results. So, all right. So, single most important reason we go to space is to get high, right? Ultimate high ground, to get that global perspective. It's more than just getting above the atmosphere. In fact, we'll see, we don't always even get above the atmosphere completely. Um, it's about uh, getting up there so we can see more stuff. Uh, that's the single most important reason. And it's not to experience zero G. So we will talk about that, that word. Uh, we don't like to use that word. Um, so the part of the spacecraft that does the business, basically does the mission, we call that the payload, the thing that takes the pictures or collects science or whatever. And then um, mission operations systems are is all the ground and in, uh, space-based infrastructure we need to coordinate. We call that the, the glue that holds the mission together. So that's broadly, we call that mission operations systems. Um, space capabilities, yep, definitely true. It'll become so integral to everything we do. It's, it's hard to imagine life without space. Uh, we've, um, we've become, if anything, too dependent on it. Um, and then uh, ISAC focuses on those uh, key areas there, uh, supply chain, business systems, and missions. So good stuff. Um, any questions before we dive a bit into orbital mechanics? Right. So when we're done here, my goal is to make you all genuine, bona fide, certified orbital mechanics. So and I can tell you where to buy the toolkit, but um, it, it's you'll be an orbital mechanic. You'll be certified to fix people's orbits, you'd be all ready to go. So that's what we're gonna do in this section is really focus on opportunities. So where are the opportunities to uh, actually do things to space systems? And some of those are quite limited as we'll see based on things like orbital mechanics. Some of them are quite open because we have a pretty wide uh, attack space potentially in the area of, of uh, mission operations. So we're gonna look at orbits and operations as two opportunity areas uh, that we have to focus on. So as I said that, uh, a little bit ago, that uh, when we look at orbits, the first order you can imagine an orbit is like a big racetrack. So think of this racetrack going around the Earth, round and round all day. I've got the Hubble Space Telescope in that racetrack, and it's just going around and round all day long. Uh, in the US, we have a, a kind of a popular sport called NASCAR. Um, and uh, the joke is, if, if you know, how do you escape if a NASCAR person is chasing you? And the answer is turn right. Um, because in NASCAR, they just turn left all day long, going around, 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 around the track. And, and that's pretty much what a satellite does. It just goes around, 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 around the track all day long. In low Earth orbit, uh, that takes it about 90 minutes to go once around the Earth. So it's roughly 15 times a day. It's going to go around, around the Earth. Um, and that's what it does. And that's what we want it to do. We want it to be predictable. We want it to be in the same orbit all the time. And those are things that they're going to help us understand how to do our mission operations. So we're trying to get into that racetrack. Well, how do we get into that racetrack? Well, to get into that racetrack, we have to remember there's this thing called gravity. And so if you drop something, it goes down. And if you forget how gravity work, works, just remember the earth sucks, it just pulls it down. So if I, if I drop a baseball, it's gonna fall. Um, so in my cartoon in the upper right, I now have a two baseball players. I have one who's gonna drop a ball and I have one who's gonna throw a ball from the same height at the same time. Um, so if I drop a ball and I throw a ball, which one should hit first? Well, way back in the day, there was a guy named Aristotle, and he thought that if you had a heavy ball and a light ball, that the heavy ball would fall faster. And it wasn't until Galileo came along and said, hey, let's try it. And he figured out, well, wait a minute, heavy ball, light ball, everything falls at the same rate. So it turns out gravity doesn't care about the motion of the ball. You can throw it, you can spin it, you can do whatever you want to it. It's still going to fall at the same rate, which at the surface of the earth is about 9.8 meters per second squared. <clears throat> so if you don't believe me, I've got a little video here that shows this simultaneous uh, dropping and throwing. So I'm going to drop a ball here and throw a ball at the same time. And you can see there in slow motion, they're, they're hitting at the same time. If anybody likes the Mythbusters, remember the Mythbusters, they did one where they, they shot a bullet and they dropped a bullet. So they, the, the bullet went like 300 feet and then hit the ground. Um, and they showed the same thing, that it, whether you drop it or even with a bullet, right, it's still going to fall at the same rate as one you drop. Okay, 
So what does that mean? Okay, so now we're gonna do a little thought experiment here to understand orbits. So picture the Earth, right? Imagine the Earth is a perfect sphere. Um, if the Earth were a perfect sphere, then for every eight kilometers you go horizontally, the Earth curves away five meters. So we're gonna do a little thought experiment here. We're gonna build a tower on the Earth that's five meters tall. And on that tower, we're gonna put a diving board that's eight kilometers long. So if I walk all the way up to the edge of that eight kilometers and look down, the Earth is gonna be 10 meters below me because I started out five, I went out eight kilometers, the Earth curved away five meters, so now the, the surface of the Earth will be 10 meters below the edge of the diving board, okay? Well now, imagine I was gonna throw a baseball. So I'm gonna go back to my tower, I'm gonna to throw a baseball, I'm gonna throw it really fast. I'm gonna throw it eight kilometers per second. So that means it's gonna reach the edge of the diving board in a second. Well, how far will it fall in a second? Well, it turns out the distance you fall is one half AT squared. So A is 9.81, so we'll just call that 10, and half of 10 is five. So basically in one second, you're gonna call it fall five meters. So you started out five meters above the surface, you went out eight kilometers in a second, you fell five meters, and you are still five meters above the surface. Well, what's going to happen the next second? Well, you're going to go another eight kilometers. You're going to fall another five meters. The earth is going to curve away another five meters. You're still going to be five meters above the surface. You are in a circular orbit. What did it take to get into a circular orbit? You had to go eight kilometers per second horizontal. Is this a condition of free of uh, zero gravity? No, you're falling. The earth is pulling you down. You are just going so fast forward that your, your earth is curving away as fast as you go forward. So you keep missing the earth, right? You're following, but you keep missing the earth because the earth keeps curving away from you. That's what allows you to be in a circular orbit. It's about that, about that horizontal velocity. So sometimes people talk about uh, centrifugal force stuff or gra if anybody tells you about centrifugal force with respect to orbits just that's not right there's no such thing as a centrifugal force it turns out um, it's all about the speed it's about going fast and so fast that you keep missing the earth if you don't believe me check newton you go into newton's if you can see uh, you know newton's sketch pad back when he was in his 20s and he drew little cannonballs being launched from cannons and showed how you would get into orbit right and that's and, and there was no uh, centrifugal force concept going on there. It's just about the velocity and this concept of gravity. Um, so depending then on how hard I throw the ball, I'm going to get into a different orbit. So at any given altitude, there's only one specific velocity that'll give me exactly a circular orbit. If I throw it a little faster than that circular orbital velocity, then I'll be in an elliptical orbit. If I throw it slower, then I'll become an intercontinental ballistic baseball and I'll take out Rio down there. Um, the shape of this trajectory is actually also an ellipse. Now they might've told you in high school physics and you throw basketballs or baseballs or something that those were parabolic. They're not, it's an ellipse. Um, so this is an ellipse that happens to intersect the earth. If I do in fact throw the ball really, really fast, then I can enter my own independent orbit around the sun I'm, uh, that's different. Uh, I'm no longer tied to the earth and I'm in my own independent orbit around the sun, different uh, than the earth, but I don't really go anywhere. Um, the, uh, and I used to say we don't do that and then we started doing that. And, uh, and as we call that earth trailing orbits now. So we use that for solar observation. Um, if I wanna go somewhere, I gotta throw the ball even faster. So it goes out to the edge of the earth's uh, gravitational sphere of influence and actually has excess velocity to go somewhere. We call that hyperbolic excess velocity. So when NASA launched the Perseverance rover to Mars last week, it not only had to escape the Earth, it had to escape the Earth with extra velocity that would allow it to go all the way to Mars. So it left Earth on a hyperbolic trajectory. It then entered an elliptical trajectory around the sun and then it's going to encounter Mars again on a hyperbolic trajectory, and they'll have to fire rockets to inner orbit. Uh, well, actually, they're, with, uh, with rover, they're going to directly enter. They've got a big heat shield, so they're going to just slam right into the atmosphere. That's how they'll bleed off all that energy, and then they'll land 
uh, on Mars using their complicated sky crane thing they have worked out. So no matter what I do, there's only four options, circle, ellipse, hyperbola, parabola. Um, and in reality, you can never get a perfect circle and you can never get a perfect parabola. So the only other things we'll see is uh, in reality are uh, ellipses and hyperbolas. And for our business of orbiting around the earth, everything is an ellipse. Now, a lot of orbits are close enough that we call them circular, um, but realize to you go out enough decimal places, they're not exactly circular. Um, so those are our orbit options. Uh, any questions on that so far? What it takes to get into orbit? What are, are there like orders of magnitude uh, in terms of how much power you need to get out there? Does it like increase significantly or is it all fairly linear? Um, that's a really interesting question. So uh, let me let me tackle that here in a second because uh, there, that's an interesting way to think about it. Um, so when I'm getting up into orbit, so uh, first of all, I got to launch the ball, right? So I got to get that ball going fast. So if I don't get it going quite fast enough, it's going to smash into the Earth. If I have it going just fast enough, it enters a circular orbit. If I go a little faster, it's going to enter an elliptical orbit. Um, so as I said, right around the Earth, you know, low Earth orbit, a couple hundred kilometers up, we're looking at going about eight kilometers per second. But when I talked about that uh, racetrack, the bigger the racetrack, the more energy, right? And we're talking about mechanical energy here. The bigger the racetrack, the more energy. So if I want to go higher, I'm going to have to add, throw it, throw the baseball harder, right? Um, so in low Earth orbit, I'm going about eight kilometers per second. But as I go out to higher orbit, let's say all the way to geostationary orbit, which is 36,000 kilometers away, I'm now only going about three kilometers per second. Okay, well, where'd the energy go? Well, this is, it's all potential now, right? I don't have the same uh, kinetic energy. I have more potential energy because it costs me energy to get out there. Right? I have to spend energy to get higher, right? I have to climb out of that gravity well. Um, but so that my the so I need to get out to to um, geostationary orbit from low Earth orbit costs you about four kilometers per second extra delta v to go from low Earth orbit all the way to geostationary. Turns out that's about the same amount as it takes to go to the moon. The to go from low Earth orbit to the moon is pi kilometers per second, so it's three point one four kilometers per second, give or take. Um, and then to get into lunar orbit is about another 800 meters per second. So it's about four kilometers per second to go from low Earth orbit to the moon, about the same as geo. And going to Mars is only about five and a half. Uh, so it's, it's not exponential um, and it's not really linear either. Uh, but one of my favorite science fiction writers, Arthur, um, Robert Heinlein once said, low Earth orbit is halfway to everywhere. You know, if you, it costs you about eight kilometers per second to get into low Earth orbit. If you have another eight kilometers per second available, you can go anywhere in the solar system eventually, right? <laughs> it might take you nine years to get to Pluto, but you'll get there, right? Um, and so it's all about the gravity, you know? So, you know, if you live, you know, there's certain parts of the country and parts of the world, when you ask people how far something is, they tell you in time, not in distance, right? So it's all about how you think about it. So in space, the distance is not so important. It's about the energy. Right? And we'll use that delta V as our kind of uh, uh, coin of the realm there. So that delta V then is, you know, depends on the orbit. And then, so the low Earth orbit is about eight kilometers per second, as I said. If you go higher, this number goes down. This goes down to about three kilometers per second out at geo. Um, so it's all about trading the energy, though. This is the conservation of, of mechanical energy. So just like being on a swing, Right? So you're, when you're going low, you're fast. And when you're going high, you're slow. So I'm trading, I'm trading uh, kinetic energy for potential energy here. Right? So at the high point of the orbit, which we call apogee, I'm going slowest. And at the low point, we call perigee, I'm going fastest. But my total energy is the same. Energy is conserved. We say energy is a conservative field, which means whatever energy you start with, you end up with, which is nice because that means if I tell you the energy of, of the orbit of the satellite at any one spot, I know it at every spot. So I don't have to continuously track orbit, uh, stuff in orbit. And for, I really probably couldn't do that even though I wanted to in a lot of cases, which is good news because I, that means I only have to track it for a little bit. And, and it's going to, if I know that energy is going to be the same all the time. So that, that's a big advantage for that. 
The other thing that's conserved in my orbit is angular momentum. So angular momentum is a vector quantity. So if you right, wrap your right hand around the direction of the, of the, of the orbit, it'll tell you the angular momentum vector. Um, so you can see that in this animation. So that, that, that what that means is that orbit plane is fixed in space. So the, or, the Earth is rotating underneath me, but that plane is fixed with respect to the stars. Right? So you see that angular momentum vector a big arrow pointing out there, that's, that's a, you know, orthogonal to that orbit plane. Um, but the plane itself is fixed in space, right? And the Earth is rotating underneath me. And that's a key thing to try to visualize. Because most people, you know, it's hard to imagine something being fixed in space, but that, that's because of angular conservation of angular momentum. And that's important in terms of what I can see when I'm going around. So as I'm going around, this, this is an animation. This is not an artist's conception. This is using a uh, uh, an animation, a uh, simulation tool called uh, System Toolkit made by a company called Analytical Graphics. Uh, we're an educational partner, so that's my advertising for those guys, but they make a, a neat tool. And that tool helps us understand the behavior here. And uh, the big, the circles you see represent different uh, things that I can look at. So that big circle, that outer circle represents everything I can see out to the true horizon. Uh, and this satellite is in a 700 kilometer orbit. The littler circle represents a field of regard for what we call an elevation angle of about 60 degrees. That big circle is an elevation angle of zero degrees, basically looking along the horizon. As I go up to about 60 degrees, I get this circle. And then when I look down with my camera, you see that little itty bitty soda straw, that's what I can actually image with my high resolution camera. Typically, these high resolution imagers only have about a degree or so field of view. Uh, that means it's gonna take me a long time to image the whole earth. So that, uh, that swath then is telling me how much of the earth I'm covering on a given pass. And it's also gonna tell me when I can see the satellite and when the satellite can see me. Right? These are the opportunities I have to interact with that satellite. So as that satellite's going over, imagine that we're tracing a line on the Earth, right? So it's just, we're going to call this the ground track. So as I'm going around the Earth, the, the yellow there is the, the equatorial plane, just for reference. Um, so I'm, as I'm going around the Earth, so notice that the satellite stays in its plane, and the Earth is rotating underneath that plane, which means I'm, I'm basically doing like a spiral cut, if you will, of the, of the Earth as I'm going around. And so if I want to if I'm on the ground and I want to see that satellite, I have to wait for it to pass over me or think about another way, me to rotate underneath its orbit plane, right? Depends on how you want to think about it. And that creates our ground track. So we have a, you know, a static map because it's hard to move a map. So we just have a map and we have our guy standing down there in South America. So when the satellite crosses the equator on, on its first orbit, let's say, the, the person could look over and see the satellite to his east. Now imagine it's a low earth orbit satellite, has a period of about 90 minutes. Now the earth is going to rotate 22 and a half degrees in 90 minutes, 15 degrees an hour. That means the next time the satellite passes the equator, from the person's standpoint, the satellite will now be to his west. Okay, so the satellite stayed in the same plane, the earth rotated underneath the orbit plane. Right? So, and probably the next orbit on the third orbit, it'll be beyond the horizon and the you won't even be able to see it, right? So this is telling us when I can access that satellite to, you know, get, you know, have it take pictures of me, have me talk to it, or if I was trying to do something to it, when I could even have that opportunity. So then different orbits will have different ground tracks. So there's uh, things that we can adjust on the orbit, we call their orbital elements. And one of those is the, the size of the orbit and the bigger the orbit, the longer the period, the longer it takes to go once around the orbit. So here you see different orbits, A, B, C, D, E. And notice A has a period of 2.7 hours, B has a period of eight hours, C has a period of 18 hours, and E has a period of about 24 hours. Notice what's happening to the ground track. The ground track is getting scrunched together. That's our technical term, scrunched. We're getting scrunched together uh, until I get to orbit D, which ends up being a figure eight. So orbit D, the, the period is about 24 hours. So we say it is synchronized with the Earth's rotation. In other words, it is geosynchronous. Now, A, B, C, D, 
A, B, C, and D have the same inclination. So inclination is the angle of the orbit with respect to the equator, if you want to think of it that way. So if I was orbiting around the equator, we'd say we have an inclination of zero. If I was orbiting around the poles, we'd say you have an inclination of 90. Um, and in the case of A, B, C, and D, they all have an inclination of 50. And I can tell that by looking at the highest point, the highest latitude that it reaches. You see where the high latitude, latitude is 50 north, 50 south. So that's telling me the inclination is about 50 degrees. Um, and then look what happens to orbit E. Now I shrink the inclination. So it's now is going around the equator. And so now the ground track for orbit E is a dot on the equator. So it is now stationary with respect to that spot. So we call it geostationary. It is orbiting. It's going three kilometers per second, but it's orbiting at the same rate that the Earth rotates. So that gives, that gives me that uh, perception of it being you know, always over the same spot. It is. It's orbiting exactly the same rate at which the Earth is rotating, which is why it seems to hover over that same spot. But it's going three kilometers per second. It's not hovering by any means. Um, so those different ground tracks give me different uh, opportunities to access the different orbits. So here's an example. This is the actual International Space Station. You can see it going around in orbit, um, its ground track. And um, so you can see the trace it makes on the globe and then the ground track. So it has an inclination of 51.6 degrees. That's because they had to launch uh, pieces of it out of Russia. And the lowest inclination Russia could reach was uh, 51.6 because they launched from Baikonur in, Ka in Kazakhstan. Um, would have been easier for us if it had been launched everything from Florida, but that's another story. Um, so that's our ground track. This is the International Space Station. Can this I is where we're oh, go ahead. Can I ask a question about that? So sure. is, it, is it because we're cl you're closer to the equator, you get more spin from the Earth? Is that why Florida is better than Russia? Uh, that way, um, yes, uh, that's a short answer. Um, so um, the uh, so when we we're launching everything from the shuttle, if we were to launch due east from Florida, we get maximum effect of the Earth's rotation. But because we had to launch from Florida into 51 degrees, which means we had to go uh, somewhat northeast, we lost capability. Um, and they ended up having to completely redesign the external tank of the shuttle to remove 8,000 pounds of, of weight so that they could get the stuff into orbit. It's quite a heroic tale we could go into offline. But, um, but it all came, it, it's amazing. And you know, so politics drove orbital mechanics, which drove technology. It was pretty amazing. Uh, but that's the way the world works sometimes. But yeah, great question. Um, so here's our geostationary satellites. So um, uh, what you'll notice here, a couple of things. First of all, one geostationary satellite cannot see the entire Earth. Um, one, in fact, to cover the entire equator, you need three satellites, and then you get overlapping coverage. But a geostationary satellite can only see up to about 70 or 80 degrees latitude. So you end up with this triangle on the North Pole and the South Pole that a satellite from GEO cannot see, or said another way, if I'm on the North Pole, I can't talk to a satellite at geostationary orbit. Uh, so if you have a direct TV dish and you're planning to move into to the North Pole to visit Santa Claus, don't take your TV dish uh, with you. I don't know what Santa Claus does, but he cannot get direct TV. Um, so most, for the most, re most part, we don't care uh, because there's not that many, nobody lives up there anyway. However, um, there are military missions that do care, and then we'll use a different orbit called a Molnia orbit or highly, a highly elliptical orbit that can cover that, those high latitude regions. Uh, but I didn't, I didn't include an example of that. But if you want to talk about that, we can. Um, so quick overview then, this is orbital mechanics. There's uh, how, the, uh, how we calculate some of those, uh, so, some of those things I had to put in. A, put in a, a second order nonlinear vector differential equation just to see if anybody was paying attention. But a um, but, uh, little bit here of how we solve that equation, we can talk about in more detail if you want in the break. Um, but I want to get to operations and then we'll pull up our poll. So remember we had these things called mission operation systems, which are all the people, processes, and things we need to do missions. So we have manufacturing, launch, and things like our mission control center, which we're used to seeing on TV. Um, and then we have our, our, architect, our, our communication architectures, which are all those links that move the data around. Remember I said space is all about moving the data. So I have ground stations and control centers and I have relay satellites. 
all that's happening to help me move the data. And I have various methods of doing that. So there are, there are various networks for helping move that data. So on the top, we see the Air Force Satellite Control Network, which I guess is could now be called the Space Force Satellite Control Network. I'll never be able to say that. Um, and uh, it has sites all around the world they use for talking to satellites. They do, uh, they manage, they talk to what, about 450 different satellites a day, if I recall. Um, that's the Air Force network. There's a, there's a Navy network, there's an Army network, there are commercial networks. There's a commercial network called Universal Space Network, and they have sites all over the world that you can rent basically by the, by the minute to talk to your satellite. Um, then NASA has a deep space network you see there on the bottom. Um, they have three sites in California, Madrid, and, and, and Australia. And then they, NASA has something called the Tracking Data Relay Satellite Systems, which are satellites in geostationary orbit that are used to talk to satellites in low Earth orbit. So if you, if you see video coming from the International Space Station, it's probably coming through TDRS. Uh, so that's how they relay data. So all of that represents really critical infrastructure uh, without those, you can't run your mission. You got to be able, you got to have those to talk to your satellite, and your satellite to talk to you. So those are important parts of the problem here. And then we have various operational activities we have to accomplish. So there's nine different activities shown in this cartoon. Uh, the one you probably most used to thinking about is flight control. You see on the upper right there, you see people sitting at a console, you know, with a headset on, you know, managing the mission. Um, but that's really just the tip of the iceberg, right? You have people doing planning, you have people moving the data, you have people doing tracking, maintenance and support, spacecraft support, mission data, archiving, all that, right? All of these are things that happen to make mission <laughs> operations effective. And a key part of that is that mission data delivery and data processing, right? Because it's all about moving the ones and zeros and, and, and these are expensive ones and zeros, right? I'm, I'm, collecting data on what's happening on Mars that's cost me a lot of money to get that data. So I want to get that data. Uh, so I have to have the data generators in space and then have the data analyzers on the ground. And, and we need to make sure we have the, the tools in place to do that. And we have a lot of trade-offs to make in terms of what we do in, in the operations planning. On one hand, we'd love satellites to just take care of themselves, be 100% autonomous. On the other hand, we maybe have invested a billion dollars in that satellite, we don't really want it to just go wandering around the solar system on its own, on, you know, without supervision. So, so there's a trade between spacecraft autonomy and how much, how many people we have on the ground. And people on the ground are expensive. For every every person you have sitting in a seat on a console, you probably had to hire five people um, because by the time you, you know, have three shifts a day, and then people take vacations and they need training, you know, it, it adds up. So. For long-term missions, more than half your mission cost can be in operations. Um, was there a question? Okay. Um, and then, of course, anomaly response, right? So if I have a CubeSat that I built, you know, university built, and it has a problem, you know, I can get around to fixing it next week, and nobody's going to care that much. But if GPS has a problem, I probably need to fix it right now uh, because we've got, you know, the whole world depending on it. So that, that and, you know, understanding the state of health and understanding the new hardware and software that I'm flying are all parts of, of the trade-offs I have to do in mission operations. So here are the key tasks again, just as a review of what we have to do in mission operations, those nine key tasks and the trade-offs that go with that. And then these are the takeaways from a cybersecurity lens. First of all, you know, getting to space is hard. Right? Eight kilometers per second, not easy. Orbital mechanics inherently limits some of the things we can and can't do for space operations and when you can even get an opportunity to talk to a satellite. And finally, there's a lot of things going on in mission operations, um, and that creates a fairly large attack surface. You know, again, people, processes, and things that I can get into uh, often spread all over the world uh, that I have to be concerned about. So all of these are important things for us to consider uh, from a uh, cybersecurity and cyberspace lens. I had a question here, does translation introduce significant orbital effects? What do you mean by translation? Higher pin? I don't know how you see your name there. Can you clarify what you mean by translation in your question? I'll have to 
come back to that again. That, so it's in the chat. You say, does, does translation introduce significant orbital effects? And I don't really do that. Oh, no, you're still there. Iropin, uh, if you can, sorry, the Earth's moving around the sun. Um, no. Um, the Earth is, you know, if I'm in orbit around the sun, the fact the Earth is moving in around the sun does not create any orbital effects on the orbit itself. Now, the sun can have a, an impact, gravitational impact, on my, my spacecraft. We call that a gravi gravitational perturbation. Uh, the moon as well. So if you see out of geostationary orbit, um, we have these sun-moon effects that actually impact uh, the, the spacecraft's ability to stay within the box that's been assigned. And so you have to spend a little bit of energy every year to stay within your box. Because if you just leave it alone, you'll, the sun and the moon will start to move you outside the box. And we don't want to be outside the box. So we spend a little energy to do that. Um, um, so uh, Matt asked about CubeSat. So, CubeSat, so a CubeSat was a, a standard that was invented about 20 years ago by some uh, folks out at Stanford and Cal Poly. Um, and uh, these guys, and, and they're still in business today, I know, know the guys, um, they just decided one day that they were going to define a CubeSat to be 10, 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters, right? And they just said, okay, how, so 10 is a nice round number in centimeters. Um, and so that became a CubeSat standard. And now, of course, that's a 1U CubeSat, 10 by 10 by 10. And you can make 2U, 3U, 9U. People are doing 26U, at which point U becomes stupid. But um, but the nice thing is what happened, it became kind of a self-licking ice cream cone in that this became a standard size satellite, you know, for a tiny little satellite. And people then created abilities to launch those. And so now if you want to launch a satellite, there are a number of companies that will launch CubeSats for you as long as you follow the CubeSat standard. And it's usually one, two, or three U's is, is the most common uh, that you see. And if you stick to that standard, then folks like NanoRacks can get you launched in six months. And the cost is, is getting down to the point that it's that literally high schools are, are launching their own satellites. Um, so it's, it's, and that it makes, of course, now we have uh, this massive proliferation of small satellites, which creates other problems that we'll talk about. But it's, it's really lowered the barrier to entry for a lot of organizations and countries and, and even schools to build their own satellites. And that's um, uh, obviously a good and a bad thing, depending on who you ask. Um, did that answer your question, Matt? On that? Yeah, yeah, it did. Uh, how much? You said it's getting cheap. How much does it cost to actually launch one? Uh, launch, I think. Last time I checked, for about a one U, and you know, there's a lot of it depends when it yeah. comes to the price tag. It was it was uh, in the fifty to one hundred thousand dollar range. I want to oh. say. Huh. Um, and wow. the and the CubeSat itself, <laughs> you want to build one that'll actually work um, for you know more than a day. You're going to end up spending a hundred thousand, probably anyway. Um, so yeah, a couple hundred k, you can get a reasonable CubeSat with a pit payload that actually can do something. Wow. Um, which you know, from millions to hundreds of thousands, uh, is is pretty good. Uh, yeah. And there, and you could from somebody, you might be able to even do it cheaper. That's that's if you actually wanted to do something. If you're, you just want to build a toy, you can go cheaper than that. But people are usually going to go to the trouble they kind of want it to work. So, <laughs> no, it's cool. Thank you. That was perfect. All right. Uh, let's uh, pull up the poll here. Let me launch the poll. While I launch the poll, if anybody has any other questions, I uh, guess had some good ones there. So go ahead and answer the poll and then we'll, if you don't have any other questions, we'll start up in about five minutes. So, um, take the poll, take a stretch, and then when we come back, uh, we're going to focus on threats. So we'll look at natural, the natural environment and the human environment in terms of threats. So if you, if you thought you wanted to be an astronaut, be ready to be disappointed. Uh, any questions? Huh? Was there a question? All right, so we'll start up again in a minute or two here. Or two here.
All right, getting there with all the poll answers. Let's give you another minute or so, and then we'll review that and then start into our next topic. All right, let's see where we ended up. So how fast you need to be going? Eight kilometers per second, not 8,000 kilometers per second. That'd be pretty dang fast. Uh, not the speed of light for sure. The speed of light is how fast you'd have to be going to go into orbit around a black hole. But, um, the, um, but to orbit the Earth, you only need to go in eight kilometers per second. Um, can you see any LEO satellite from any spot on Earth any time? No, no, you can't. Um, so again, the key there was low Earth orbit satellite because that's low is pretty low as we're going to see. Um, and um, so you can only see at certain times of the day, you know, maybe only a couple of times a day, depending on where you are. Um, a geostationary satellite definitely cannot see every spot on Earth. You, you can only see about a third or so of the Earth at any given time, not even quite a third. Um, so that means we need multiple geosatellites to, uh, uh, to provide full coverage. So if a bad guy wants an opportunity to covertly contact your satellite, they're going to have to wait until that satellite passes over them. Um, there's really, now they could, uh, you know, they could bounce something through another ground station anywhere. Um, but um, if I'm trying to do it directly, I have to wait for it to pass overhead. And then opportunities to threaten space ops, uh, all of the above. Everybody got that. So pretty big uh, threats, threat surface there that we have to concern ourselves with. So good stuff. All right. So who wants to be an astronaut here? Who wants to be an astronaut? What if I could just, you didn't have to go through all the training, I would just get you into space. Yeah, sounds great. Oh, as long as I don't have to pay, as long as I don't yeah. have to pay money. All right, well, after we go through this section, uh, let's see if that's still the case. Um, all right, so, um, so here we're gonna look at threats. We're gonna look at natural threats and man-made threats. Um, as we're gonna see the, man, the natural threats are bad enough. And we don't, you know, don't need to give me human threats because we've got enough to deal with, it turns out. Um, so we want to look at both uh, both kinds, though, um, and the natural threats especially are important because about a quarter of all anomalies that spacecraft experience are a direct result of the natural environment. So you can read all the different uh, things that have happened over the years to different satellites uh, because of the natural environment. The, uh, there's a radiation storm that affected the stereo satellites. Um, there was a coronal mass ejection that impacted the Dawn satellite when it was orbiting Ceres. Um, the Galaxy 15 one is interesting because again, this was uh, having to do with electrostatic discharge that caused a, because of a solar flare. And that satellite lost its mind. Um, it was wandering around geostationary orbit out of control. So people on the ground could not send it any commands, but it was, it was broadcasting, it was on, and it was broadcasting. So it was interfering both physically and RF to other satellites. Other satellites had to actually get out of the way of it. Um, and then eventually uh, it kind of accidentally uh, pointed away from the sun and the, the battery discharged and it did kind of a control alt delete and reset itself and then it was fine. You know, so uh, that, was, that was a crazy one. Um, and then that's animation in the top here, you see an impact of this is a collision between two, uh, two satellites, one was a dead satellite, one was a live satellite, um, and that caused a whole bunch of debris. Uh, so these are all just issues that come up because of the space environment. Because space is dangerous, and you got a lot to worry about up there.
So no beans on the space station. Just keep that in mind. Don't don't fart in a space suit. But um, so where's space? It turns out space is not very far away. Um, it's uh, about 100 kilometers, 60 miles straight up, and you can drive straight up. Um, there's something called the Kármán line uh, that kind of defines, you know, a generally accepted beginning of space, but there really is no internationally defined exactly where space begins. Um, in fact, if you're only at 100 kilometers, you couldn't stay in orbit because there's just too much drag. Uh, you need to be at least another uh, 20 miles further before you can even have a hope of staying in orbit very long. And really, you want to be even higher than that. Um, so if any of you bought your tickets to ride on Virgin Galactic, I guess it's going to be early next year now, uh, 200,000 uh, bucks, you're going to get a ride to space. Um, and they're going to define space as 100 kilometers. So um, you're not going to go into orbit. You're going to go up and you're going to come down. Um, but hey, 200,000 bucks, you know, trillionaires, there you go. So space isn't that far away. So if you imagine the Earth were the size of a peach, the International Space Station is just above the fuzz, right? So the fuzz represents the atmosphere. It's just that little fuzz, and that's it. We're not that high up. I mean, we're like, yee, right there. In fact, it's not even to scale in that picture because it's too, too hard to draw it that close. Um, really, really, really close. Um, that's, that's to get to space. Now, once I get in space, space is really, really, really big. You know, so to try to put that, those distances in perspective, we tried to you know, put some things to scale here. Um, so imagine the sun were the size of a house, um, then the earth is the size of a baseball, so roughly what, about eight centimeters or so in diameter, <clears throat> no, 10, mil, uh, 10, 10, 10 centimeters in diameter, um, and it, but it's 1.2 kilometers away, or you know, three-fourths of a mile away. That's how far away we are from the sun. And the moon is the size of a large marble, about an inch in diameter, and it's, uh, it's 10 feet away or three meters away. And this is the one I have trouble wrapping my head around because, you know, you look at the moon at night, it seems closer than that. It seems bigger than that. But it's really just optical illusion and how our brain processes stuff. So the, the moon, you know, get, get a baseball and a marble out sometime and pace off the distance and, and you'll just, you won't believe it. But it's true. I've reran the numbers many times and that's how it works out. So, um, and then you go to Pluto, and Pluto's, you know, 20, almost 30 miles away, and again, about the size of a marble, uh, 30 miles away from the sun. So, you know, the, just the size of, this, of, the, uh, of the solar system is a little hard for us to grasp, really. So huge distances involved here. But once I get out to those distances, once I'm out there in space, there's a lot of nasty stuff I have to worry about. So there's six main things that we worry about, gravitational environment, the atmosphere, or and lack thereof than being in a vacuum, uh, the debris environment, and then radiation and charged particles. So I'm not going to say much about the gravitational environment. Uh, that tends to be a bigger issue for fluid handling and especially for humans. Um, but we're going to focus on the things that are the biggest threats to spacecraft, uh, which are all the other things. So let's start with atmosphere, drag, uh, and atomic oxygen. So in low Earth orbit, there's still a little bit of drag and there's still a little bit of atmosphere that's going to slow me down. So atmosphere, or the atmosphere basically is like friction on my spheric spacecraft. It's going to rob energy from my orbit. Now remember I said the bigger the, or, the bigger the orbit, the more energy. So if I take energy out of the orbit, the orbit gets smaller. Right? Or we're getting smaller, eventually it gets so small that I re-enter the atmosphere completely. Um, that atmosphere decreases exponentially with altitude. So come visit us here in Colorado and get off the plane and you'll know immediately that the atmosphere has decreased a bit from sea level. Um, the atmosphere doesn't go completely away ever. Uh, well, not ever, but I mean, uh, you know, goes up to uh, NASA detected you know, molecules of the atmosphere up to about uh, out, out by the moon. Uh, but those are like molecules they detected. Um, so but in, in terms of low Earth orbit, we use 600 kilometers as kind of a rough rule of thumb. So in other words, if we're below about 600 kilometers, then, then uh, atmosphere drag is something we probably have to worry about. If we're above 600, then probably it's nothing we need to worry about. Uh, but again, it's not hard and fast, it's just roughly. Um, because when I look at that drag equation there on the left, the drag that I get from a satellite uh, depends on a number of things. Uh, one of the things it depends on is the velocity, how fast I'm going, uh, the, the drag coefficient, basically the shape, and then the cross-sectional area of the, of the spacecraft. So I know most of those things. What I don't know very well is the density. Because that density of the atmosphere changes day and night, it changes with season, it changes with latitude, 
and it changes based on what mood the sun happens to be in. And the sun goes through these 11 year cycles of moods, uh, at least as long as we've been watching it, which isn't that long really. Uh, but so far it's 11 years as far as we've been, we can tell. Um, and we're actually just coming off the latest solar minimum. So, so the sun is always putting out these charged particles I'm gonna talk about and we call the solar wind. So those charged particles are always coming out from the sun. And uh, think of that as a constant breeze coming from the sun. But the sun is going to get more active, less active over this 11 year cycle. Right now, it's we're just coming off the, the solar min, about ready to start back into the next high part of the cycle. Um, when the sun is not very active, the atmosphere contracts, which means there's less drag. When the sun is fairly active, the atmosphere expands, which means there's more drag. So we've been going through a period of relatively low drag. <clears throat> we're starting to enter a period of relatively high drag. Uh, over the next uh, six to eight years. Um, in addition, when uh, UV light hits the hits uh, oxygen molecules in the upper atmosphere, they break apart into atomic oxygen, so individual uh, atoms of oxygen, which are very reactive. You know, oxygen by itself, as you know, is very reactive. It's why things rust. Um, but when I have atomic oxygen, it's even more reactive, and that can cause damage to the surface of your satellite. So these are issues of simply the atmosphere. Again, generally issues below about 600 kilometers. The International Space Station is at 400 kilometers. So yeah, it has to worry about this stuff. If we didn't do anything to the International Space Station, at solar maximum, the International Space Station would re-enter in about three months. Um, at solar minimum, which is where we've been, it'll re-enter in a couple of years. Uh, but it's a big difference between maximum and minimum in terms of how that impacts drag. But for the most part, space sucks. We're in a vacuum. Right? And because we're in a vacuum, we have other things to worry about. One of the things we have to worry about is called outgassing. So if you have a soda bottle and you shake up the soda bottle and open up the top, you're going to hear the fizz. Well, what's happening? You have, you're releasing pressure and the gas is escaping. Right? So the dissolved gas in the, in the liquid is escaping because of the released pressure. Same thing can happen in space with materials. So if I have uh, polymers or adhesives or anything like that, they, they tend to, during manufacturing, they'll have uh, alcohols and other uh, volatiles that will get stored in there. When I release the pressure, those things will come off. We call that um, <coughs> outgassing. And in space, there's uh, one really important law that governs everything we do, and that's called Murphy's Law. If you're from England, it's called Sod's Law. Don't ask me why they're different. But the laws are different. The guy's, di the guy's, the guy's different. The law's the same. And Murphy's or Sod's Law says that anything that can happen will happen at the worst possible time. And the corollary to that in space for outgassing is that, that outgassing will go wherever you don't want it to go, uh, which is probably on the surface of your mirror or sensor or things like that. We also worry about off-gassing inside where the crew lives because the crew has to smell everything. You know, if you ever bought a new car, then a car smells like a new car. Well, what's new car smell? It's outgassing plastic. Right uh, now in your car, you can simply roll down the window and you don't have to smell it anymore. But if I'm the International Space Station and I have a smell like that, I, I can't roll down the window. Right. There's not that's not going to work for me. So that becomes a hazard for astronauts. So they want to make sure they don't have anything uh, smelly like that, anything that will off gas plastics or things like that. Uh, we can also get cold welding in a vacuum. This is where two pieces of metal can literally get fused together because we get a weak molecular bond between the two pieces. Um, we can get tin whiskers that can form on um, tin solder, which is why we like to have a bit of lead in the solder so we don't do that in space because that, that, that crystallization can cause a failure of solder joints. And probably the most problematic thing for being in a vacuum in space has to do with heat transfer. Um, there are three ways to move heat, convection, conduction, radiation. Um, it's in convection is what's keeping you cool here in, in, in your room, uh, air blowing around you. Uh, Conduction, if you, you feel when you stir your coffee with a metal spoon. And then radiation is what you feel when you actually feel the heat coming off a of fire. Well, in a vacuum, I, I can't conduct anything. I don't have any air blowing around me. So the only way heat's getting in and the only way heat's getting out of my satellite is through radiation. Um, so you see on the right there, the bottom right, uh, you see the radiator panels on the International Space Station. So they use ammonia loops. So the ammonia flows around where the astronauts live, carries the heat, goes through those uh, panels, 
where it is radiated into space and then the, it cools off the ammonia and then the ammonia does another trip back through the, where the astronauts live. So we, we do testing in space using these chambers you see at the top, a thermal vacuum chamber to make sure we know how things will behave, spacecraft will behave when we get up there into space. Um, so the, that thing on the front of your car that cools your engine, what's that called? What do you call that thing in the front of your engine that cools your engine? Radiator. Radiator. How does it cool your engine? Heat transfer. Yeah, convective heat transfer, not radiative heat transfer. That thing should be called a convector. I'm on a campaign to change its name because I'm tired of it called, people calling it a radiator. It's a convector, right? You're, you're pumping fluid around the engine block and then air blows over the veins and, and cools the fluid. That is not radiation, that is convection, my friend. So uh, buy the, next time you go buy, make sure you buy the convector fluid, not the radiator fluid. It's a little more expensive, but it's more precise. So anyway, um, so that's an issue with being in a vacuum. Uh, another issue being in space is all the junk. So here's the history of the junk. Like those cute sets. <laughs> It's important to note that each of those little blobs are not to scale. Uh, but um, so we're up to 20,000 objects in space that we're currently tracking. So this is the, the box score. You can, this comes out quarterly. So this is the last one that came out. So we're just over 20,000 objects. Um, uh, Nancy, I got that's from AGI. I think I got that off of YouTube. Uh, you could Google it. Um, they may even have a newer one. Uh, they put a new one out every once in a while because you notice that one's about four years old. But, um, but uh, 20,000 objects that are 10 centimeters or bigger. So think softball size or bigger. Uh, we can tend, and that's a limit of what we're able to track. So we have tracking capabilities on the ground. So the U.S. Space Force now in charge of keeping track of that. They have a the satellite uh, satellite space surveillance network of satellite of uh, ground systems that, that track that radar systems. Um, and currently the limit is about 10 centimeters in low earth orbit and about beach ball size out of geostationary orbit. Um, that capability is about ready to change. The, the Space Force is about ready to bring operational a thing called the space fence, which means they'll be able to track things smaller. Um, how much smaller uh, depends. Um, and But people are saying what's going to happen is that number is going to change by a lot, maybe by an order of magnitude. Um, just because we'll be able to see things that now we know are the, we're sure are there, but we can't see them. So now we are blissfully ignorant, but then we'll be able to start seeing them and we can't be blissfully ignorant anymore. So we'll now instead of 20,000 objects to see, we'll have 200,000 or more that we'll have to keep track of. Um, so, and that just keeps continuing to proliferate. 
There have been numerous satellites damaged by debris and, it's, and numerous other satellites uh, you know, maneuvering to avoid debris has become fairly routine. Uh, I mean, but you know, every time I have to move my satellite, I'm spending propellant that I'm never going to get back. So that's, um, it's interesting, you look at geostationary, we once worked out what, it, what propellant is worth at geostationary orbit, because a geostationary satellite makes like $100 million a year revenue. And if you work out what the propellant is worth per gram, it, it's more expensive than plutonium. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's way more expensive than gold. It's like more expensive than plutonium. It's, uh, so if I have to spend some of those precious grams of propellant, I'm not going to be happy if I'm going to have to dodge a piece of, piece of junk. You know what I'm saying? Um, but that's the situation that we're dealing with. Um, but the big dog in space is the sun. So the sun is putting out a number of things we have to pay attention to. First of all is electromagnetic radiation. So the physicists you know, they use this word radiation and they're not always clear about what they mean. So I'm going to distinguish between electromagnetic radiation and ionizing radiation, AKA charged particles. Uh, so for electromagnetic radiation, we mean light and heat, right? And, and all across the electromagnetic spectrum, literally from X-rays and gamma rays all the way up to radio waves. Um, you can see the graph up there of the output of the sun. Most of the sun's output in EM, uh, not too amazingly, is right in the middle of the visible. Um, and that's a function of uh, uh, Wien's law, it turns out. But any, and you see, this is actually Planck's law uh, plotted there. But the peak of that curve is right in the middle of the visible, uh, but the, uh, which is convenient for us because that's what we can see. Um, but the uh, range is all the way from X-rays all the way up to radio waves. Um, so that the the uh, infrared, of course, is going to cause heating. The light we can turn into solar energy. Um, ultraviolet can cause damage of our surfaces. We can get radio interference from the sun. The sun is actually very noisy from a radio standpoint. And, the, and we actually get solar pressure. We can get force from the sun, from light. So light is made up of uh, waves or, or particles, depending on what mood you happen to be in when you do the experiment. And uh, if it's a particle, we call that a photon. Now, photons do not have mass. Turns out they don't have volume either. Um, and, but they do have momentum. So uh, and that's a quantum thing. So uh, a photon can actually transfer momentum to you. And it's not much, it's like five newtons per square kilometer. But if I have big old solar rays hanging out from my satellite, uh, that can be significant over time. And if I had a really big sail, I could literally sail around the solar system, harnessing the pressure of light as I did that. So I have to worry about that. Um, but the, probably the bigger worry are the charged particles. So by charged particle, I have to go back to the definition of an atom. If you guys remember you know, the Bohr model of an atom, where in the nucleus you have a proton and electron, proton being positive, and then the electron being negative, going around the outside there, and the neutron neutral. Um, and you probably know the story about the two atoms. Two atoms were walking down the road. One fell down, and his buddy helped him back up and said, are you sure? Or he said, are, are you OK? He says, no, I, th I think I lost an electron. He said, are you sure? He said, yeah, I'm positive. So that's how you know you lost an electron. And Neutron walked into a bar and the bartender said, for you, no charge. Bartender said, we don't serve faster than light particles in here. A tachyon walked into a bar. So think about that one. So, um, so I got these charged particles. So I have ions, which are positive, you know, positively charged. And then I have electrons or negative. And they're coming from the solar wind, which I said is this constant breeze coming off the sun. And then occasionally I get these big solar particle events, which is like a gust of these charged particles. I also get them coming from outside the solar system. We call those galactic cosmic rays. And then I get them, uh, get them concentrated in the Van Allen radiation belts in the Earth's magnetic field. So I kind of can't escape these things. And if you're watching that video on the bottom, you're seeing the, the sensors on the SOHO satellite sort, sort of fizzed out there when it got hit by a big solar particle particle event. So it affected the, the sensor there. Um, so these charged particles come in kind of two flavors, um, but uh, we're going to worry about uh, low energy and the high energy um, stuff. And uh, the low energy we'll call plasma. So the plasma effects having to do with arcing, the, the plasma effects are mainly going to be on the surface. So arcing, uh, electrostatic discharge, electromagnetic interference, and re-attracting of contaminants. 
Mostly this is gonna be a problem at, at GL, less so at Leo, um, and mainly on the surface. So this is an annoyance, but not something that's gonna really uh, uh, be a big problem. I just noticed Pete's question there, can the entire orbit be taken out with debris? Um, we're almost there. We're, you see that there were some popular uh, orbits there, geostationary, you actually see a ring. And then uh, in low Earth orbit, especially the sun synchronous orbits, they're, they're, they're getting so popular that, that there's a lot of debris built up there. Not to the point that that orbit is unusable, but it's, there's certainly more debris in some orbits than others, that's for sure. So thanks for that question, Pete. <clears throat> uh, probably the most problematic issue has to do with the high energy charged particles. And so every once in a while, the sun uh, burps out a big bunch of charged particles in a coronal mass ejection shown in this animation in the upper right there. Luckily, most of the time it's not aimed at us, but if it is, we got to be ready. So we get this big coronal mass ejection, all these big gusts of charged particles. Lucky for us, we have our shields up. So our Earth's magnetic field protects us from that big blob of charged particles, deflecting most of it. Uh, but some of those charged particles get trapped within the field lines, and then they go down and interact at the at the field generators where the Klingons always target down there and interact at the poles where the field lines come together and cause excitation of the atmosphere, which causes the glow, which is the northern lights and the southern lights. Now for our spacecraft, those charged particles are getting those high energy ones are gonna go whipping through the surface of our satellite like it's not even there and go right through our electronics. And if it happens to hit the right spot, if the little bullet happens to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, then it can cause a latch up of one of the uh, uh, transistors on your microprocessor. It can affect the ability for your semiconductor to carry charge. And all of that can have problems in terms of how your system's gonna behave. So there's a immediate effects here we call single event phenomenon. And, and they happen like that. I mean, and they're like little bullets going in all the time that are causing issues with how our system can behave. It can flip a bit, it can latch up a, a part of a, a, of a uh, transistor. Um, and there's sort of two effects here. I think of them in terms of uh, uh, sunburn and skin cancer. So the sunburn's happening today, skin cancer cancer is happening over many years. So you get a, a total, a, an immediate effect, and then you get a, we call a total dose effect of a cumulative uh, degradation of the ability for our semiconductor to actually work. So at some point, it simply stops working you know, after some number of months or years, depending on the substrate material and depending on the orbit that I'm in. That, Total dose then eventually causes my system to simply shut down, stop working. So, and uh, we can uh, look for materials that are less susceptible, but eventually everything succumbs. We have not found a, a system that's 100%, you know, unless you go to back to iron core memory, uh, anything that's a semiconductor is eventually going to succumb, at least as far as the technology we know now. Uh, so, we can use some shielding. I, people usually guess lead is the best shielding, but it turns out that's not the best. It turns out hydrogen is the best shielding, but hydrogen is not very convenient. Uh, water would be next best, but and if I have humans on board, I probably have water anyway, so that's good. On the International Space Station, they actually use polyethylene, high density polyethylene, a couple of inches of that. The polyethylene is a hydrocarbon, so there's a lot of hydrogen there, because the hydrogen that acts as the shield for them. Um, but whatever I do, I have to build in error detection and correction because this stuff is going to happen. I mean, it's just price of doing business in space. So I have to have some quite a bit of software overhead to be constantly checking for these problems um, because they're just going to happen. So the natural environment's bad enough. Now I got to worry about the, the, the unnatural environment, the human environment. And, and these were the good old days. The good old days, we just launched satellites and we talked to them and everybody was cool and everybody was nice to each other and we didn't have to worry and we barely had any software anyway, so it didn't matter. Um, and that life was good. Uh, that ain't the way it is anymore, right? Now we have bad actors. Uh, we're way more dependent on software and these bad actors are doing things like spoofing and eavesdropping and denials of service. Um, all of these are things that we now have to be concerned about. Um, but we're not really prepared in the space industry. So we have some challenges in our industry. First of all, as we've just seen, some of the problems that can happen in spacecraft are, are hard to distinguish between a natural problem and an unnatural problem. Uh, if I have a single event upset, it, it may not immediately be obvious that that's, you know, because of the natural environment or because somebody hacked me. Um, 
Also, space has suffered from a bit of, you know, it can't happen here mentality, you know, where you tend to think we're, you know, we, you know nobody's going to bug us, but, you know, we're special. But, of course, we're not that special. Um, and space tend, has tended to be fairly conservative, inflexible, and very non-agile in terms of adapting over time. A bit complacent, we could say. And we tended to view security as more of an afterthought than a forethought. Um, and, and part of it is because fixing things is difficult and we can patch our systems. We can even do, you know, new software updates, but we're limited. We're basically, we can't change our hardware and we're limited in the ability of what we can do even to our software. So we just have, we just can't react that fast. The other issue is that the, you know, this, the attack surface just keeps growing. We're relying more and more on software. We have more and more uh, distributed missions. We have a lot more actors involved. We have um, um, our software tends to be more outdated because we we in the space business tend to build missions that last sometimes for decades, and so we're still using software from you know that nobody else has even heard of, um, and then we have trouble you know removing that software at, at end of life kind of problems. So that's the space environment issues. Again, space isn't that far away. We have a number of natural environment things we have to contend with. Big one from a uh, upsetting spacecraft standpoint or the, the high energy charge particles, which will cause those single event upsets and bit flips and things. And from a cyber's perspective, what I want you to take away here that first of all, again, space is hard and space sucks because it's vacuum. Um, so it's, it's hard enough to get things to work in space, you know, even on a good day, because that natural environment is a pretty big threat and it's causing denial of service randomly already, um, you know, without any human intervention. Um, and some of those anomalies we, that could occur if, you know, if there was a nefarious actor, we'd have a hard time immediately discerning the difference between a natural attack and an unnatural attack. Um, and the other thing to take away is just how fragile space, uh, spacecraft are. A you know, relatively minor hack, like you know, causing a, a solar array not to point quite at the sun, even if it was off by a few degrees, would decrease the amount of power it could produce, which might decrease its ability to do its mission, and on any number of things from a relatively smart area. Um, um, so Gretchen's asking a question here, in the vein of threats, human actions, there are so many vulnerabilities to ground system that support space that can be attacked. What would cybersecurity hack look like in the ground infrastructure? What would they get and how could you protect against it? Um, we're gonna tackle some more of that here in a minute, uh, Gretchen, thanks for that question. Um, but we're, as we saw in that previous section, there's, uh, I listed nine different activities uh, for mission operations. And any one of those activities is a potential inroads for an attack. Um, and that, and that, in terms of that, and because they all represent parts of the ground infrastructure uh, as well. And, uh, you know, some of them more vulnerable than others, but any one of those are potential inroads because you have people, processes, and things involved. And, and people can be a, a weak area there. And sometimes just the, the infrastructure we have because it's maybe antiquated or doesn't have the, you know, and we're running, you know, legacy software from decades ago, uh, we have more vulnerabilities in that respect. So hopefully that, that answered your question. Um, so let's, uh, let's check in. Any other, any other questions from that section before I pop up the, the uh, um, the, the poll. So who still wants to be an astronaut after seeing the threats? Who's changed their mind? Oh, Pete, you're still ready to go. Okay. Wear your lead underwear. Oh, wait, I guess you better wear your hydrogen underwear. Um, um, take a visit over an extended stay. Uh, kilt. Okay. You're, uh, yeah, that'll help you. <clears throat> so, um, Astronauts will tell you, because uh, you know, we didn't really talk about the human issues, but I mean, it gets scary to talk about what happens to humans, especially in the free fall environment. That's, that's, that can be pretty bad. But the astronauts will tell you they'll see flashes of light in their eyes. So a charged particle goes through the eyeball, releases a photon. Your, your retina can detect a single photon, and you, they see these little light, light bulbs going off in their eyes at random times, which is a bit of a freak out. Um, so that's that's an issue. Um, we talked about shielding. Um, the uh, the uh, again for uh, human missions, we can use water. In fact, NASA talks about using creating like a storm shelter because these big solar particle events luckily don't last that long. You know, days. Um, so if you can get astronauts to hunker down 
underneath bags of water for a couple of days, they'd probably be okay. Uh, but the, the radiation effects on humans is, is pretty, pretty critical to look at because a, a round trip mission to Mars is a, is a lifetime dosage. Uh, NASA sets the dosage limits based on age and gender. Um, women can take less dosage than men and older people can take more dosage than younger people. So of course the answer for going to Mars is to send old men because you won't miss us anyway. Um, <clears throat> and then you could argue about whether you should even bring us back. So uh, in terms of a safety issue, but there you go. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, so Terry's talking about, she, uh, Terry, you wanna say something about that JPL thing? Yeah, sure. So a couple of years ago, JPL was hacked and they were hacked because there was a an unattended, unauthorized little Raspberry Pi, just a simple little computer hooked up to their network. And so an external threat actor got in, actually came in through that Raspberry Pi or targeted it, was able to crawl around their network for about 10 months and um and received about 500 meg of data about one of the mars missions so that's just an example where you know you've really got to watch the people in your network and what they are putting on your network yeah and i guess be conscious that you know all it takes is one slip up and somebody's just waiting for that slip up you know in that case <clears throat> um you talk about gravity effects on humans so uh quickly there's three things with gravity effects on humans uh, moans, groans, and stones. So the moans come from vestibular issues where you just are space sick and you feel like crap because you're, you're just, you know, motion sick. Um, bones comes from a lack of, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, force on your, on your bones. So your bones lose, uh, lose, lose mass. And, and then stones come from a fluid shift because you get fluid that moves to your upper body because your, your legs keep pushing fluid into your upper body, even though it doesn't need to. And, you're, and you, you start offloading uh, liquid, which means you become dehydrated, which can lead to kidney stones. Uh, so all that are issues, the gravitational effects. Uh, building rotating space stations would be cool, but um, the, you know, if you look at the mass of the entire International Space Station, you'd need a couple times more of that mass to build something even close to big enough to be useful because if it's a relatively small radius, people would just throw up if they're going around in circles like that. So you need a pretty big radius. And I can't remember what the minimum radius is. Somebody's studied that, but it's it's like 50 meters or at least. Uh, before otherwise, you just you, the Coriolis would give you uh, uh, all kinds of uh, um, vestibular issues. So it needs to be a pretty big thing. So now we're not quite ready to big, build something that big yet. Uh, that'd be nice though. All right, let me release the poll. Release the hounds. Um, release the poll. So we just did uh, threats. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and take this poll, and then uh, we'll give you about uh, five minutes or so to take the poll, and then uh, we'll review that. We got time for a little stretch break, and then we'll start back up at the, at the bottom of the hour. So that should be 4.30 uh, Pacific time. And, uh, all right, yeah. And then, uh, so I guess we might well have a schedule, maybe we'll have a schedule. Um, so we'll start back up at 4.30 uh, Pacific time, and then we'll pick up with uh, vulnerabilities here in a minute. So go ahead and take the poll, and then we'll check in and see how everybody did with that.
All right, let's see how we did here. So we have a poll sure results. So first question, space is incredibly, amazingly, ridiculously far, far away. Um, nope, pretty close, right? 100 kilometers. Uh, drag affects all satellites in every orbit. Uh, I guess you missed that one. So no, right? It, remember we said 600 kilometers was sort of the, the rule of thumb there. So if we're above 600, then no, I don't need to worry about drag. Um, below 600, then yeah, I do need to worry about drag. So maybe I misspoke there and confused you on that one. So I said, yeah, there's atmosphere all the way out to the moon, but not not enough to worry about. Uh, but so it's, uh, but the uh, 600 kilometers is sort of the line in the sand there for us. So those uh, bit flips are caused by the high energy charged particles are pretty, pretty much got that one. And uh, yeah, the scary thing here is anomalous behavior by satellite uh, could be indistinguishable from a natural threat. So it's really hard to know right at first. And then all of the above and represent the uh, cybersecurity challenges that we talked about. And then the key things there for uh, denial of service was the uh, TOS flood, the Internet of Things botnet attack, and then ping flood type issues. So most of you did okay on there. <clears throat> All right. So let me stop sharing that. Um, so let's move to our, our last section. And then you want to stay tuned because we're going to have our little security challenge, cybersecurity challenge here at the end to see how you do. So uh, here we want to look at some specific areas of vulnerability, um, the RF systems and data handling systems. Um, so we're going to look, uh, look at those pipes and those uplink and downlink pipes that we talked about. Uh, we want to know what goes, how do those pipes work? How do I set up a pipe? And that means how do I maybe disrupt a pipe as well? So these pipes are fine-tuned things. We need to make sure that they work correctly because it's all about moving the data. And then we'll look at the data handling system. So I've got my little cartoon there of a computer and we've got some uh, ones and zeros there. If you stare carefully there, you see that uh, my artist put a two in there. So I guess that's a bit flip and that happened. Um, so let's start with a communication system. So the, this is the ears in the mouth of our spacecraft. So we have to listen for commands coming up from the ground and we have to talk to send telemetry down to the ground. Um, along the way, we have a lot, we have to turn that data into modulated information that goes on to the carrier, as we'll talk about. So we have um, modulators and demodulators that work with that carrier signal that we'll look at uh, to actually move that data from where it needs to go. And then that data then connects up to the data handling system, as we'll see here in a little bit. Um, so the key part here is these uh, communication architectures. So I hope that we have, again, it's all about moving the data. So I have ground systems all over the place. I showed you those uh, Air Force Satellite Control Network and Deep Space Network and that, you know, Universal Space Network. We have these ground stations all over the darn place and we're moving data all over, the, all over uh, between them. Now, space to space and ground to space, the downlinks are gonna be RF. Now, once it's on the ground, then we can move things around through fiber. Right, fiber is actually a lot better than RF for a whole lot of reasons. Um, but for space, ain't no fiber up to the space, at least yet, until we can build that space elevator. Uh, we're kind of stuck with RF links. And so that they create their own ch challenges and vulnerabilities, uh, as we're going to see. Um, so let's talk about how RF communication works, which means we have to talk about how communication works. Um, and I'm sure everybody, when they were a kid, got to play with two cans and a string. Um, and kind of unlike the, the cartoon in the top, the string needs to be tight. So our scientists there are not holding the string tight the way they need to, but uh, for you know artistic license there. So um, the guy on the right is going to talk into his cup, and that's going to his voice is going to bounce on the bottom of the can, and his voice will then get modulated onto the string. Now the string is going to carry that vibration to the other. Uh, person who's got the cup up to her ear and it's going to bounce on the bottom of her cup where it'll be demodulated and then he's she's going to hear kind of whatever it was that he said okay um, so RF communication the only difference is no string in fact it's really it's the carrier that acts as the string as right? the carrier is where we're going to modulate our information onto but we have to have that carrier so we have to have that string that goes from me to you and that's how we're going to get our information there now, it turns out there's various ways to modulate 
that information onto the onto the carrier. And in the space business, we tend to use digital communication. And there's uh, three basic ways you can think of to do modulation, two of which you have in your car, amplitude modulation and frequency modulation. So our cartoon there shows a simple example of amplitude modulation, where low amplitude means a zero and higher amplitude means a one. I could do frequency modulation. So every time I shifted frequency, that could be a zero or a one. In the space business, we tend to use phase modulation, where every time we swip, swap phase, we can go between a zero and a one. So, um, you know, kind of pick your pick your language, really. Uh, it turns in space, that, it turns out that phase modulation is a little more forgiving. So we tend to use that more in space, but there's, I mean, we could use the others if we wanted to. We just don't, they don't work as well. Uh, but for, you know, on, for your car, it's fine. You know, we're fine. Um, so very, various ways to do that. Now, what we're trying to make sure happens is that we can have a conversation, right? Between the spacecraft and the ground, they need to have a conversation. And that conversation is no different from what you, the conversation you want to have with your buddies when you're out, you know, out, out at the restaurant or the bar at night, back when we could go to restaurants and bars. Um, we all, but I'm sure most of you remember being in a bar at one time in your life, and you're trying to have a conversation with somebody on the other side. And there's a lot of things that we're going to com that complicate that. Uh, first of all, you and your whoever you're talking to is helpful if you're speaking the same language, right? If you're trying to speak to someone in a language they don't understand, it doesn't matter how loud you talk. Most of, well, of course, Americans know that if you talk English loud enough anywhere on earth, people will understand you, uh, but that's not usually the case. Um, so we, we need to make sure we pick the right language. Um, and we also need to be on the right frequency. You know, so if I'm, if I'm using, you know, dog whistle frequency, you're not going to hear me, right? So we, you know, let's pick with audio frequencies here. Um, distance is important. If I'm too far away, you can't hear me. And data rate is important. If I talk too, too quickly, you can't really understand me. You might hear me, but you won't really understand me. So I, I have those things to play with, language, frequency, distance, data rate, and then environment. So if somebody's making a lot of noise, then I'm not gonna be able to hear what the other person's saying either. So all those things have to be balanced to make sure we have effective communication. And what we're really after here is making sure that the signal is greater than the noise. If the signal is higher than the noise, then you're probably going to hear me. If the noise is greater than the signal, then you're probably not going to hear me. Um, and this gets uh, tied up into what we call Fry's equation, which is for how we calculate link budgets on all of these various links I just showed you. So it looks like a little complicated equation, but it's really not that bad because what it's really doing is implementing the things that we just talked about. So uh, instead of being in a bar having a conversation, now I'm having a conversation between two, two dishes, as we show there on the bottom right. Um, and so the same things apply. I have to pick the right frequency, in this case, the frequency of our carrier wave. <clears throat> I have to pick the right language, which is the modulation. I'm worried about distance, which we call space loss. I'm worried about the data rate, and I'm worried about noise. Um, so all of those are things I have to consider, and they're all packed into that equation there at the top. Because what we're trying to do is ensure that for every bit, the energy is greater than the noise. So we call that energy per bit to noise ratio or EB over NO. So the energy per bit to noise ratio wants to be greater than one. And, and that's going to be determined by a number of things. I have only a number of things I can play with. Transmitter power, basically how loud I'm going to talk. Transmitter gain, how I you know maybe uh, direct what I say. Um, the space loss, how close I am. Uh, the receiver antenna gain, how big the ears are on the ground, and the data rate. You know, the lower the data rate, the easier it is to, to get the message through. So uh, there's not that many knobs I can turn here, um, but these are the things that I, that I have to have all in place to make sure I have effective communication. So if I were to impact any one of these in some negative way, I'm going to reduce my ability to communicate significantly. Um, and, you know, we, we see that already with things like Voyager. So Voyager's Keeps, keeps going, keep going and going and going, Energizer Bunny, right? Eventually the, the power on its uh, uh, radioisotope thermoelectric generator is going to give out, I think, in about 20 years, they said. Um, but even now, it's so far away, the space losses are, are basically killing our ability to hear it. In fact, I, I don't think we're going to be able to hear it in about another five or 10 years. Already, its signal is below the noise, and it has to keep repeating itself over and over and over before we can finally pick the signal out of the noise. Uh, but, you know, for something in low Earth orbit, we can't have it just keep repeating itself. We want to hear it the first time if we can. 
Uh, so these are challenges that we have to face. And the other challenges have to do with the limitations that we have for uh, building up these links. We have some physical limits that have to do with the atmosphere. So certain frequencies are going to get attenuated by the atmosphere, especially some of the higher frequencies that don't, don't like going through rain very well. Um, there's some technical limits in terms of just how big of an antenna you can put on a satellite. The, but the biggest antennas flying right now are uh, about uh, 15 meters. Um, it's just hard to put in and, and that art has to fold up like an origami and then unfold. Um, the uh, Galileo spacecraft we show there in the illustration at the top, it went to uh, Jupiter back in the 90s. Um, and it had this high gain antenna that was supposed to unfurl like a, an umbrella, but two of the ribs got stuck together. They think it was cold welding. So they could never unfurl that high gain antenna. So they had to run the whole mission on the low gain antenna, which they lost something like an order or two orders of magnitude less data rate uh, to be able to run the mission, which is problematic. So, you know, just by affecting that one thing, <coughs> you've impacted the mission greatly in terms of its ability to move data. Um, and of course, there's other technical limits to consider as well. I can only generate so much power on board. Um, and uh, a lot of the stuff, you know, on the ground are already built, the frequencies are already established. So there's just things, limits to what I can do. And then of course, there's legal limits. Um, the, you can't just, you know, wake up tomorrow and decide you're going to start your own radio station. Uh, the FCC is going to come shut you down. Um, and the same goes in space. You can't simply launch a satellite and start broadcasting willy-nilly in whatever frequency you want. You have to get approval to use that. And the pro approval comes from through the International Telecommunications Union. And that's fairly highly regulated, which is a good thing. Otherwise, it'd be chaos up there. Um, so even though you might want to do certain things, if you don't have the frequency allocation, then you're not you're going to be uh, out of luck in terms of how, what you can what you can actually do. Um, the uh, so the the trade space then here ends up being you know what what can I do to affect my EV over NO? How can I make sure that when I talk, people can hear me and understand me? Well, what can I do? Well, I can talk louder, right, and get more power out of my spacecraft. But there's going to be a limit, right? There's, there's, there's only so much power I have available from my solar panels. Um, I can get a bigger megaphone, right? I, but again, there's, I can only put so big of an antenna on my spacecraft. I can try to get closer, but hey, if I'm Voyager, I'm leaving the solar system, man. That's not an option. Um, I can try to get bigger ears on the ground, but most of our ground stations are already fixed. They're, they're, they represent billions of dollars of investment. I'm probably not going to simply go build new ones necessarily. Um, I can try to talk slower, uh, that'll make it easier, but then I'm going to take longer to get the same information to the ground. Uh, that means it's going to take more passes to, to do that. I can try to reduce the noise in the environment, but there's a limit to what I can do there, especially for existing systems. And I can try to move to higher frequencies, but you know that means new technologies often. Um, we're getting a, a crowding right now because a lot of the frequencies that space has traditionally used are starting to get more terrestrial applications as well. And when there's a, a contest between space application and terrestrial applications, terrestrial tends to win, um, which means space is getting crowded out of its traditional you know, S-band, C-band uh, frequencies. In fact, there's a, a slew of satellite orders just came in this year to try because they're trying to re, you know, you, uh, provide better utilization for some of the C-band frequencies that are available, which is a good news to people building satellites. Um, but the, uh, so there's a, there's a push to move uh, space to higher frequencies, which is good for a lot of reasons, but bad because we don't necessarily have all the infrastructure in place. So it's going to represent a big in investment to start moving your frequencies around. So those are issues we have to think about uh, when it comes to uh, these, these things. Um, so those are the key issues with uh, uh, communication. So again, I wanted you to understand Fundamentally, how communication works. Uh, that you know, we've got the two cans in the string. We got our carrier, and here we have our carrier wave, which is some you know frequency that's been allocated to us. And then we're going to modulate our information on top of that. When we talk, we want people to hear us, which means we need the energy per bit to be greater than the noise. So that means I only have so many things I can play with there in terms of how loud I talk, how big my antenna is, uh, distance, frequency, uh, language, speed environment. 
Um, and then we have some limitations we have to deal with, physical, technical, legal, and a number of trade-offs then that uh, impact what we can and can't do with that. Uh, any questions on RF? So you just got about a, a semester course on RF communication in 15 minutes or so, but I uh, want to make sure you understand where the, because it's fairly technical, but it's it's a technical because it's it, it really impacts what you can and can't do. A lot of it's physics and, and technology, so we have to be aware of what those limitations are, both from a security standpoint and a vulnerability standpoint. Um, any questions on any of that? How's my EB over NO coming through? So far, so good. Nancy, can you hear me? All good? All good. Loud and clear. Everything All sounds right. great so far, yeah. And should we say 3DB? That would be, that would be good. Um, so, um, all right. Well, let's look then at the, what's happening in the data handling system. So the data handling system now is our really our brains of our spacecraft. So it's, it's doing all the thinking for us. And so it's got a lot to do, right? If you think of its to-do list, it's a long to-do list. It's got to respond to commands from the ground. It's got to come up with telemetry from the, the, the health and status as well as the payload. Uh, it's got to boot up on its own and self-test, and it has to fix errors if it finds them. And it has to control everything on the satellite. It has to control the heat, it has to control the power, it has to control the pointing, it has to control the rockets. All that stuff has to happen in board that, on, in board that. and it has to be ready to be updated. So over the air updates, kind of like a Tesla, it's got to be ready for over the air updates whenever they're ready. Uh, and that could be patches, it could be complete software updates uh, over the life of the mission. So that's that's a lot. On top of that, it's got to do it in the space environment. When we just talked about how nasty that place is, so I have to deal with all that on top of everything else. So it, it makes this uh, data handling problem uh, pretty difficult. So that, that brains of the operation then is, is tightly coupled to the communication system because it doesn't do me any good to handle data if I can't communicate it. So we off, sometimes it'll be called the command and data handling system, sometimes the communication and data handling system, depends on who you talk to and which organization they're in. Um, but it's, it's all about moving the data, right? So I can't communicate the data if I can't handle it. And just because I handle it, I still need to communicate it. So all pretty much goes together. Um, so what's in there? So let's look under the hood here and see what's there. And, and not too surprisingly, we're basically talking about a computer, right? So what, what's in there? Well, we've got some sort of central processing unit, probably multiple central processing units. Um, we have memory, RAM and ROM, pretty much you know, solid state memory these days. You don't fly tape drives anymore. Um, and then input output devices. So uh, space uh, business tends to lean heavily on standards. Uh, so there are a number of data bus standards that are fairly common. One is called Mill Standard 1553. There's another one called Spacewire. Um, and they'll, you know, the 1553, I want to say is what, about one to three megabits or something like that data rate, which is fine for most applications on a satellite. And, and people build equipment to that standard, so it's easy to get to. Um, and then we have a lot of other components, too. So we have uh, transducers that are measuring stuff all over our spacecraft. So whether it's temperature or pressure or whatever, uh, we have transducers that act as analog to digital converters uh, to uh, you know, turn those uh, analog world into a digital world uh, so that we can do stuff with it. Um, we make a lot of use on space systems on, on uh, uh, field programmable gate arrays, FPGAs. Uh, they're, they're fairly versatile uh, processor units that you can uh, program in, uh, in uh, firmware to do any number of things. We'll use them for digital signal processing and other kind of well-defined tasks on board a spacecraft. So you'll see a lot of FPAs, FPGAs show up. Um, and then sometimes application-specific integrated circuits uh, that may be a custom circuit that are done for a specific application. Again, maybe uh, digital signal processing or maybe some particular uh, payload interaction or something that we're doing. Um, that's all the hardware. Of course, the hardware is kind of the easy bit. And then we get to the software. Right? And without software, we got nothing. Right? We just got a box of silicon. So it's a, it's a software that's enabling. So we more and more think of spacecraft as a box that flies software. Um, we think of software as the complexity sponge for how everything gets done. 
as you go around the spacecraft and look at every single subsystem, every pretty much every subsystem needs some amount of, of software, some more than others, uh, but it's pretty hard to do much of anything without software. Um, so, and software, it's, and that's true across aerospace. There was a, a gentleman giving a talk a number of years ago from Lockheed Martin. I think he was a chief technology officer, chief scientist, and he was talking about that. I think he was talking about the F-22. And, and he said that the, the half the cost of the F-22 was in testing and half of that was in software. And he made the kind of the joke, and he said he was only half joking, that Lockheed might be better off giving away airplanes and charging for software. Um, and, and that's kind of where we're going, right? The, the price of hardware is asymptoting to zero and the price of software is asymptoting to infinity. Um, so most of the cost these days is in software development, testing, maintenance. Um, you know, we're kind of shifting to a world of DevOps of where we, you know, we're kind of continuously maintaining and developing your code because that's, that's where the functionality is. I mean, and I'm a hardware guy saying this and having to admit how important software is. Um, so this is where we're going and that, and we're depending on it more and more. So software use has been going up following Augustine's law, which is 10 X every 10 years or so. Um, it's funny, you go back to 1960s and, and NASA flew Mariner six. I think it went to Venus with 30 lines of code, three zero lines of code. Uh, now it's probably machine code and, and all of you who do software know that lines of code is a terrible metric but we use it anyway, because if you, if you can't, can't measure what's important, measure what you can and argue that it's important. Um, but we, um, you know, so now fast forward today and when they launched uh, uh, the uh, rover on its way to Mars last week, it probably had something like 2 million lines of code on it. Um, 2 million lines of code is not impressive when you compare it to a car. So a new car probably has 100 million lines of code. Um, but space is different, right? So we're, you know, even so space is going up exponentially in its name, in its use of code. And the way we use code is still different from, from a car where we have to, we have a lot more demands on space software than we have even on automotive software. And, uh, and that creates again, more of a threat space for us uh, to, to be concerned about. And when we start depending on code, <clears throat> of course, code can let us down. So this is that famous example of uh, what happened with the uh, Mars Climate Orbiter. And uh, Mars Climate Orbiter had, uh, was on its way to Mars, was gonna enter orbit around Mars back in 99. And uh, the way this mission was, and I'll play the video there. Um, so it was on its way to Mars, it was gonna enter orbit around Mars. And uh, it was gonna fire its rocket to enter orbit. Remember it's on that hyperbolic trajectory. And if it was gonna just fly by Mars, if it didn't slow down. So it gets ready to slow down to enter orbit around Mars. But wait for it, they were only off by 169 kilometers, which means they re-entered, they entered the orbit of uh, atmosphere of Mars and burned up and there they went. Um, so all, all, all because of a units problem. This is the infamous units problem you might've heard about. So what happened here is that there were, uh, the way this mission was operated is you had operators in Denver who were keeping track of the, of the bus basically, and then you had the mission control, which was a jet propulsion lab out in California who was managing the mission. Um, the guys managing the bus out in Denver were keeping track every time the satellite fired these little rockets, and they'd use these rockets for attitude control, but they also had slight uh, impact on the, uh, on the trajectory as well. And they were keeping track of all these rocket firings, and they'd put it into a file, and then they'd ship it out to JPL where they would actually model the trajectory. Well, the guys in Denver were putting it in the file, modeling it as the thrust being in pounds, pounds force, uh, which is an English unit. And then they shipped it out to JPL where they assumed it was in Newtons. Well, what's the difference between a pound and a Newton? It's a factor of four. And I, the way I tell Americans to remember this is when they go to McDonald's in Paris, because every American who goes to Paris goes to McDonald's, that they should order a Newton burger instead of a quarter pounder, because that's how you remember that. Um, not a true thing, they don't really sell Newton burgers, but there you go. Um, so they were off by a factor of four, um, which, you know, again, very, they weren't firing these rockets very much, so it was a relatively small correction. Um, and to me, there's an interesting uh, uh, Murphy's Law thing going on here. Um, you know, you think about it, 
they could have been off 160 kilometers in the other direction, right? I mean, left, right, up, down. It just happened to be down. You know, talk about flipping a coin and having it go the wrong way. Um, it's, it's simply the way it ended up. If they'd ended up 160 kilometers further away from Mars, they would have still entered orbit and they would have said, oh, wow, look, and they would have been fine. Uh, but because they flipped the coin the wrong way and they ended up closer to Mars, uh, they burned up and, and all that because of, you know, the way they managed the software there. Um, so they didn't, uh, the software management development plan wasn't, uh, was not fully followed. And they hadn't actually, interestingly enough, they never categorized this as critical software. Um, uh, Pete's asking how much margin of error do they allow for? Um, you'd think they would allow for more than that. hundred, you know, you know, they made it, you know, 40 million kilometers and we're only off by 160. So you'd think they'd have a little bit more margin for error than that, you know, um, because, you know, once you're, you know, if you're trying to get into a 400 kilometer orbit around Mars and you instead entered a 600 kilometer orbit, the, the cost to change that is relatively small. Um, so I don't know if they were just trying to, you know, show off and see how closely they could get, but that, that did not work out for them, but you're, you're, you're spot on there on that question. Any questions about this uh, particular debacle? There's other, other examples of software getting us in trouble in the space industry. There's the, the maiden flight of Ariane 5, where they reuse software from Ariane 4 because you know, heck, it was just a different rocket, why not? And that reused software caused a trajectory deviation, which caused the rocket to blow up. So, um, so these kind of things can get us in trouble. Uh, Mars Polar Lander, one line, basically one requirement was not allocated to software. And so I, you can't really blame software on that one. It was really more of a system engineering uh, failure. But, uh, you know, these sometimes, you know, seemingly simple things can cause total disaster. On, on systems like this. And, and this is just, this is all us doing it to ourselves, right? You know, let alone some nefarious actor getting in there and helping us along, you know? So uh, we, do, we, do, we do enough damage to ourselves uh, without that. Uh, the lander, another lander was a, a European lander, Skier Pirelli, which I can never pronounce correctly, but he was the guy that discovered the canals on Mars. Um, that, that crashed again, that was um, not again, not, Probably not a software error, but not completely well-defined software in terms of how it handled the, the excursions on the inertial measurement unit. So, you know, there's always, you, know, you always kind of point to a, a root cause problem, uh, but, you know, again, the space is hard enough without people doing bad things to us. Um, all right, any other questions on that? So key design issues then uh, to think about for uh, data handling. Um, you need to know what uh, what level of autonomy your spacecraft has to deal with. And the more autonomy, the more complexity. Um, you have to understand all the tasks. What, what are you expecting your software to do and where will it get done? Uh, we have some choices. We can do things on board. We can do them on the ground. We can do it in hardware. We can do it in software. We can do it in software. We can do it in firmware. Um, you have to understand the environment that you're going to be dealing with. How bad will the that, that uh, ionizing radiation environment be? Um, NASA has a mission at, at Jupiter right now called Juno, and they had to take all the avionics and they put it inside a titanium vault, and they used the best possible avionics that they could get and still did all the shielding. And so far, it's been holding up. They thought it would only last about an Earth year, but I think they're going on, what, three years? Uh, I haven't seen much report on what they're... Uh, single event upset issues are, but they seem to be still doing okay. Uh, but Jupiter has an even worse radiation environment than the Earth because it has a more intense magnetic field. Um, uh, NASA is talking about landing on one of the moons of Jupiter, Europa, where they have the ice fields and there's the under, under the ice, there's an ocean where the intelligent whales live. And, uh, but they think when they land on that surface, on the ice there, they may be only good for a month or two because of the radiation environment there. So, uh, Luckily, the, the intelligent whales are protected by all the ice, so they're good, but um, I probably mutate a lot. Um, what was the thing from uh, the mutated sea bass? These are mutated uh, whales. But, um, anyway, so uh, the other thing I need to think about are developer needs, right? So I got to develop this code. How are we going to build it? What language? What development environment? What tools? How am I going to test it? Um, 
And then we have all the operational LEDs to consider, flexibility, maintainability, and we should also throw sustainability in there. Um, one of the challenges we face in the space industry, especially, is that we use, you know, we tend to use stuff for decades. Uh, when, the, when the last space shuttle mission landed, the last HAL programmer lost their job because the shuttle was programmed using a language called HAL, um, circa, you know, state of the art 1975, uh, which by, you know, 2005 was no longer a thing. Um, so, you know, when we're trying to maintain software for decades, that creates huge problems for us. And, uh, and of course, threat surfaces as well. So these are the takeaways then for the data handling, uh, understanding what it needs to do, how it has to correct for errors, uh, the, the hardware software interactions that we have to deal with, and all the software functions that have to be performed both on board and on the ground for our data handling system. So takeaways from a cyberspace uh, lens here, um, that first of all, RF security is a relative uh, small sub niche of, uh, of cybersecurity uh, because we tend to focus, as you might expect, more on you know, fiber because that's what most data is moving around. But RF is a unique, you know, we are uniquely dependent on RF in the space industry. Now, and getting access to that equipment is relatively easy, but as we mentioned, everybody tends to encrypt their stuff, so you have to know their encryption capability. Um, but there are a lot of hardware software vendors out there. There are multiple development environments. There are legacy languages, and all those create additional vulnerabilities. And then, of course, space relies heavily on software, and, and the more people get involved there, the, uh, the more, uh, you know, both grounded on board, the more additional vulnerabilities uh, we end up making. Um, any questions on the, uh, on the vulnerability section, on the RF or data handling? How are they looking at future AI? Um, yeah, AI is an interesting discussion. I mean, space, I'd say, is fairly far behind on that in a lot of ways because, again, we tend to be pretty conservative in how we approach that. Um, there, you know, I've seen discussion of AI more for things like data mining on uh, going through, you know, Kepler's data for looking for planets, you know, using it, you know, for post-processing, but not so much for uh, you know, real time. Um, I remember even back in the 80s, there was talk about, you know, uh, expert systems supporting uh, operators. But, it, you know, it's amazing that even 30 years later, that still has not really become a thing. So, um, you know, that's it's a kind of that trade off between autonomy versus automation that we get a lot. So I don't see a whole lot of talk, uh, maybe uh, something that maybe um, uh, Terry might have a better insight there, but I haven't heard a lot of talk in the space business about more emphasis on AI for certainly for operations. <clears throat> Decision support, yeah, maybe for operators. But again, I haven't, I remember that being a, quite a bit of talk many years ago, but I haven't heard much recently about that. Uh, Terry, do you have an update on AI applications? I don't, not in the space arena. I haven't really seen anything uh, there either. <clears throat> yeah, it's again, we tend to be pretty slow to the party for new technologies like that. Um, uh, we're going to find the slides, Mano. Um, they are posted, and maybe if Matt's on, he can tell you where they are in the, um, uh, in the Discord channel. Are they in the Discord channel, Matt, the slides? They are in the Discord channel. Yeah. Mano, they're there, and if you can't find them, uh, email me, and I can always send them to you. Okay, let's, uh, let's pull up. I'm going to do two things here. Um, I'm going to give you your cyber challenge. So here's your cyber challenge for the day. Um, so I'm going to go through the challenge. Then I'm going to post the poll. Then you can take the poll while you're thinking about the challenge. And then we'll get back together and, and talk about it. So, um, so here's our scenario, right? So um, there's a company called Wiley Imaging, and they've been operating a high-resolution commercial remote sensing satellite now for about two years, <clears throat> and the U.S. government is one of their biggest customers. Uh, it's in a sun-synchronous orbit at an altitude of 710 kilometers, and it has a node crossing of 1030 southbound every, every morning. Right? Or in, in the morning, when it crosses the equator going south, the local time is 1030 in the morning. 
Okay, that, as we call it, sun synchronous. That, that means you get shadows, uh, you get mid-morning shadows every time you fly over the equator like that. Wiley operates uh, their own ground station here in Colorado, uh, but they lease access to two other ground stations in Norway and Alaska. Um, they're up at the high latitude, and this is a, a sun synchronous, which means it's a nearly a polar orbit, which means the Norway and the Alaska orbits, or ground stations, can see that satellite nearly every orbit, uh, which is convenient. Um, the satellite was built by Acme Aerospace in Iowa, and there are two other satellites currently in development that plan to be launched next year. So that's the background. So the issue is, uh, in the uh, and during the last two passes, we had a pass over Norway, and then we had a pass over Colorado. The operators notice bad headers on about 10% of the health and status telemetry data packets. They didn't see any problem with the payload data packets. And, you, nor, nor, and it's actually not unusual that you have separate downlinks. You have a downlink for health and, and uh, health, health and status, and you have a separate downlink, separate frequency for payload data. So the fact that those are different is not uh, too amazing. That's actually kind of normal. Um, so they saw, but they only saw the problem with the health and health and status packets, uh, and it's on the header on the packets. But this is about a thousand times worse than they would have expected, because we usually plan for like. 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6, let's say 1 in a million bits to be have a problem. And here you're seeing about 1,000 times worse than that, or maybe even worse than 1,000 times worse. So it's a lot worse than they would have expected. Um, so here are your challenge questions. So first of all, how would you determine if this issue were due to uh, natural or man-made causes? Um, what would your potential reasons be for, if it were natural causes? Assuming, assuming though that it's malicious cause, what opportunities would a bad actor have had? Um, assuming it's malicious cause, what vulnerabilities could a bad actor have exploited? And then given there are two other satellites in development, what other design or operational changes could we think about for, uh, to prevent future issues? So those are the questions I want you to ponder. Um, while you're pondering that, I'm going to put up the the poll, last poll of the day here. So you can I'll let you multitask here. So um, you can do the poll and then think about the, the cyber challenge. Or you can do the cyber challenge and then come back and think about the poll. Um, but let's um, let's take about 10 minutes to uh, go through that. And uh, I'll give you 10 minutes to take the poll and, and think about the challenge. And then uh, we'll get back together and we'll see if some uh, brave soul on, online here wants to volunteer their, uh, their answer to the challenge. So if you, if you have uh, a multi-deck slide presentation in the next 10 minutes, I'll let you share that with, uh, with the team. So uh, let's, uh, but let's take about 10 minutes and think about the, the poll questions and the challenge scenario, and then we'll bring it back together, review the poll, and then we'll step through the, the how to think about this particular challenge uh, challenge problem. And then we'll wrap it up and we'll be able to call it a day here on time. So uh, so go do uh, one or the other or both and uh, we'll check back here in about 10 minutes.
If anybody has any questions about the uh, challenge, just let me know and we can and try to clarify things for you. We'll be looking for a brave volunteer who wants to tell us how to solve the challenge here. And I've also posted an end of course survey. Uh, we can't use polls and uh, for surveys because the data is not persistent in uh, Zoom. So we have we're using a separate polling thing. But if you could follow the link to do that poll, we'd uh, appreciate your feedback. That'd be great to help us figure out how to improve the course for next time. Um, so I'll give you another five minutes or so to think about the the polls, our poll questions here, and then. Uh, and then we'll pull together and talk about the challenge and then wrap it up.
much attendance on the polls here, but let's go ahead and close that out and then we'll talk about our challenge. So which of the following does not the following change would not increase EV over NO, so data rate. So making a higher data rate would be the wrong way to go if I'm trying to increase EV over NO. Um, to jam a satellite, you need to be have some noise at the receiver. That would do the trick. Um, threat service is software has not been static. It is not been static over the years. It's um, been growing. Uh, to spoof a satellite, you need to know all of the above things, which is a lot of things. Uh, you have to be aware of, which means you probably need some sort of way to uh, get into the details of people's design requirements. Um, and uh, space software is both a light and agile. That actually, no, we're kind of the opposite of light and agile in the space business. Um, all right, well, let's talk about the challenge. Uh, do I have any brave soul online who wants to tackle the questions? Anybody feel confident about talking through the how you think about these challenge questions? Only one person at a time. That's a nice thing about uh, virtual presentations. The ability to remain anonymous is uh, is much higher. When you're in a classroom, it's sort of kind of hard to hide. You know, I can stand, I can hover over you and intimidate you to 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 uh, tackle it. So. Um, it's less intimidating if we talk through it together. There we go. Let's do that. Um, so um, let's um, let, so let's, let's kind of talk through the background first. So um, remember the, the background information here. So so I just want to highlight some things that come out of the background. You know, and as we approach these, you know, as you go forward and start thinking and working in in this environment. Um, yeah, we think about, you know, what, what kind of information should I be keying in on? So one of the, on the first bullet there, we want to key in on the fact that the U.S. government is one of their largest customers. So um, certainly everybody in the world is sort of fair game, but the U.S. government is sort of a high profile target. So if you're supporting U.S. government, you're kind of putting a target on your back. Uh, so that, that raises the threat potential up quite a, quite a bit, just the fact that they got you, you know, government's one of their big customers. Um, the next bullet has to do with the orbital mechanics, which we covered here within the class. Um, so just the, the type of orbit I'm in will, will uh, in this particular orbit, will limit the number of times a day that somebody could have access to that satellite from a given site. So, uh, so that really restricts when somebody could have had access to that satellite, you know, line of sight. So, that, that, that is a constraint that kind of narrows the window there in which somebody could have had access. Um, the other thing to clue in on there is that the Wiley is operating, uh, they're leasing ground stations from in Norway and Alaska. So these are lease stations. So these are companies that are basically just selling time on their ground site. So these people, you know, so, you know, I'm anytime like I'm leasing something, I don't have a lot of control over the software, the procedures, the personnel. You know, these people are just doing a job passing data from one person to another. They're gonna work, you know, get my data right now and 10 minutes from now, they'll get data from somebody else. They don't have any particular loyalties to my, to me, my company, my data, my program or anything, right? They're just doing a job. And uh, that means I don't have a lot of insight too because I'm basically buying by the minute I probably can't demand to see all their software, the procedures or security reviews their, you know, polygraph interviews with people. If they do that, I don't have any right to ask that stuff, right? I'm just buying by the art. Um, and then finally, we got two other satellites in development, which is maybe a good thing. We ought to think about, okay, well, if there is a hard, hard problem that we've come up with, maybe there's a chance to uh, uh, resolve that. Um, Pete's saying, can you put that in the contract? You can try, um, but you know, if, I, if you know, if I'm Universal Space, uh, Universal Space Network, I'm, you know, I probably have a hundred customers, and I got one small customer coming in demanding a bunch of stuff for security. I might just tell them to take a hike. Like, sorry, I, you know, I, I don't have the time to give you that, or, or I'm going to charge you a lot for that. You know, so it just depends on how big of a, a lever you have, and you know, if you're one of end customers, you probably don't have that big of a, a lever on that. Um, 
So the other thing then to think about from an issue standpoint, um, uh, so as I said, uh, you know, this, this, uh, imp this uh, issue only uh, impacted the health and status, which is not necessarily unusual. Uh, so that is, this should not, you know, it's not overtly suspicious. So that shouldn't necessarily raise any alarm bells, but it's, it's, it's a useful thing to be aware of. Um, and uh, so that appears the problem is just in how the protocols are implemented. So this is, tends to be a software thing where, you know, you're going to be taking all these ones and zeros and organizing them into packets and adding uh, headers and footers and things like that. Um, but it, but it appears to be random, but it only appears to be on the header. So, but again, depending on how that packet protocol works, that is not necessarily suspicious either. Uh, you know, so, um, but, but, you know, but these are all things to just file away in the back of your mind before we tackle uh, the question. So we always want to, you know, make sure we understand the, the lay of the land before we dive into the details of the question. So first question is, well, how do we know that if it's natural or man-made? So I put up here a, a, what's called a fishbone diagram or root cause analysis or Ishikawa diagram. Uh, some of you may have seen these before, uh, but they're a very useful tool to try to get at root cause. Um, and we do it with without prejudice. We just, it's a brainstorming tool. And uh, you can think of it as a mind map if you're used to mind maps. But uh, so we say we kind of list and you've all seen detective movies, right, where the detectives have the big board and they have the suspects and they have, you know, yarn going between everybody in circles and all that. I mean, that's kind of what this is. This is our our suspect board. And so we say, well, who, who are the usual suspects, right? And equipment, process, people, materials, environment, management, those tend to be the usual suspects. Um, and we would lay out within those, okay, from an equipment standpoint, what could cause this problem? What, from a process pro standpoint, what could cause this problem? And we're not trying to solve the problem. We're trying to say, who are the suspects in this problem? And then we can start whittling away. Once we've defined the, the, the space, the, we call, might call the trade space of options, then we can start whittling away. We can go interview the suspects, see if they have an alibi, if they have an alibi, then okay, then they're not a suspect anymore. But we'd be thinking about uh, equipment on board. Okay, well, what about that equipment? Hardware, software, are there any processes? Maybe somebody on the ground did something wrong in the configuration and, um, and it's, it's being garbled on the ground. Maybe it's coming, it's fine on the spacecraft, it's getting garbled somewhere on the ground. Um, maybe there's people, maybe people that had poor training, maybe there's people that are maliciously uh, you know, scrambling this on their own. You don't know. Um, environment, of course, would be a, the big thing to look at. Uh, single event upsets, and what we might do there is call up the space weather people and and find out if there was any sort of um, large coronal mass ejection somewhere in that time period. You know, we're trying to correlate. You know, what you know, the the time because we can sort of narrow down when it happened because it seemed to be fine one pass and then it wasn't fine the next pass. So that, that narrows down the window there. And if there was any sort of specific thing going on, maybe there was a solar event uh, that, that could have happened in that time frame, or maybe it was going through this area of the Van Allen belts we call the South Atlantic anomaly. You know, any of those things could, uh, could you know, be, raise our suspicion level. Um, um, you're saying wouldn't that affect everything, not just the headers? Well, it's random, right? So I, all I need is one silver bullet to go into my software, and I don't know what it's going to do. You know, and if it just happened to affect the one place where that gets encoded on the headers, then you know, I I can't immediately rule that out. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's it's high, you know, low probability, but I don't I wouldn't immediately rule that out, right? Um, so, so I want to take a look at it. And, I, and I want to do this systematically. What we're trying to do is have an, you know, an unbiased, you know, let's not jump to conclusion and, you know, start launching nuclear weapons at bad guys because they attacked our satellite. Um, we want to, you know, let's, let's find the smoking gun, but let's do it methodically. So this is how I would go about trying to, uh, to come to that root cause. And we may decide, no, there, you know, there's the probability of this being natural is just too low. It it's has to, and you know, the uh, the impact is too too systematic. It's not random enough, uh, and therefore we might sus you know start to suspect you know people, which is you know malicious actors in that case. Um, if it were environment, which is question two, 
again, we've been as Ray, we've been talking, it's most likely a single event upset that could cause that, but but not necessarily. It could be a maybe thermal stress led to a problem with a processor or something like that. So you know there are other potential environmental causes as well. But single event upsets tends to be one that causes these sort of random events. But assuming it is malicious, going to question three, uh, where are the opportunities? Well, I mean, if, if it happened between passes, that's a pretty narrow opportunity. I say, I mean, maybe an hour, they could have had opportunity to do some, some, something directly in there. Um, and again, that's not out of the question, but that would mean they would have had to actually command our satellite directly, which means they would have had to know all those things we talked about. They'd have to have the frequency, they'd have to have the, the encryption, they'd have to have the command codes, <laughs> they'd, they'd really have to know our system very well. Um, not out of the question, but again, fairly low likelihood. Um, so it would seem it's probably more likely that that came in somewhere sooner. And, and maybe it came in as a Trojan horse to be, you know, with a, with a time tag that says after, you know, you know, 30 hours from now or 30 weeks from now, uh, implement this. Um, and so and so who knows when it was injected? It could have been all the way back to the factory, right? So we don't know at this point. Um, but th those are, so that's that's the malicious thing. That's the scary thing about code is that, you know, you can put code in that can be see sitting there, you know, kind of the sleeper agent to get, uh, get activated, who knows when. Um, so what are the vulnerabilities then? Just, you know, again, if I'm talking about hundreds, you know, a satellite like this probably has hundreds of thousands of lines of code. Um, yeah, you could be hiding in there somewhere uh, and, and maybe get overlooked, maybe even get overlooked during testing. Um, and the fact that we've got these, we're using the ground stations, that to me, that's a that's a red flag in that it's just, you've got things outside your span of control, uh, your direct span of control that can be uh, entry points for bad actors there. And then finally, because we, we have these guys still in the barn, being, uh, being developed, um, if it turns out the problem is a natural environment problem that our, our hardware maybe is not robust enough against single event upsets, I mean, we could consider swapping out processors. I mean, that's a pretty major design change, especially fairly late in the game. But if it turns out we're particularly vulnerable or maybe there's some thermal issue um, that caused it, we may have to do, take a serious look at our design uh, to see if we can mitigate that in, uh, in, in, but through a design change. Uh, if it's code, we may have to do a, a full scrub. We may have to go back through and look at all the software ground and on board to see if there's anything hiding in there. And maybe we need to go take a look at our personnel. Maybe go to do a you know, security check on our people and see if there's any, anything suspicious going on there. And somebody you know, driving to work in a Ferrari and last week they had a, you know, a, junker car um, and, you know, where'd they get all the money all of a sudden kind of thing, um, you know, that might look suspicious. So, so those are things we could look at. Um, Pete's asking if it was a code update, how would they consider do that for ones on orbit? Um, well, we can, we actually can change code on orbit pretty well. I mean, again, depending on the extent, uh, you probably, you couldn't change your entire architecture maybe so much, but, but if it turns out that was, you know, this was lurking in one unit or module of code, we could, uh, that would be a, you know, not, I would say easy thing to do, but it's a doable thing to re uh, overwrite that code or patch around it or something like that. Yeah, we, we make code changes fairly often. I mean, you know, almost, you know, I would say routinely are making code changes uh, on spacecraft. So that, that would not be a difficult thing to do depending on the extent. Now, again, if it's, you know, if it's, corrupted badly, that might take a lot of surgery to fix, but and we may not have a choice there if, if this is a problem. Um, anybody see, did I miss anything there? Any, uh, any other issues or ideas that maybe we might want to think about as we tackle this, this challenge? All right, well, I think we did pretty well then today. So let's uh, recap what we did today. So we, uh, 
we went through, uh, we started with context. So we looked at that mission architecture and the reasons we went to space. Uh, we talked about opportunities. So we looked at orbits and operations, uh, got you all up to speed on how to do a, uh, you know, to become orbital mechanics. So you're getting ready to get out your, your wrench and fix an orbit next time. Um, we looked at threats, natural and human threats, especially those natural threats and how insidious they can be. And you know, just the, the denials of service we get on a day-to-day -day basis just because space is a hard place to be. Um, and then we finished up looking at those vulnerabilities. So the RF, uh, RF links, spend some time looking at how we make sure that we get vi uh, viable uh, connections through the RF links. And then talked about the, the data architecture and overall data systems ground and on board uh, that also become potential threat surfaces for us. So that was what we tried to cover. These were our objectives. So again, we're trying to climb that learning trajectory there from, from the pad all the way into orbit. Wanted you to have some core space knowledge so you feel a little more confident talking to people about space issues and some of the limitations and capabilities and threats and vulnerabilities that are out there. Uh, wanted you to understand some of the trade-offs, especially as they apply to cybersecurity domain. Um, things like the access that you get from orbital mechanics and the, the, all the different things that happen in operations, those nine different things that we laid out of, of activities and operations. And, and any one of those can be a potential entree for uh, a threat. Um, <clears throat> the natural environment, I hope you had a, an appreciation for how hard that environment is just you know, on a good day. Um, and now when we throw bad actors in there, what uh, what you know relatively small changes can have big impact on overall mission operations and then finally I wanted you to be able to uh, step back from some real world scenarios and apply the knowledge that we gained here in the class and be able to look at those critically to understand what kind of issues uh, might come up and how would we think through these issues and, and we're going to see these issues i think come up more and more uh, over time and we have to be able to you know differentiate the natural naturally occurring problems from the unnaturally occurring ones, and then figure out what to do about it. I mean, we've got a, um, there's a lot of potential holes to plug here in terms of uh, vulnerabilities. And we may be, you know, running around plugging holes or, or all, all our life, but we have to be able to ready to identify those holes and think about what kinds of things we can do to address them uh, going forward. So we thank you for your time and attention. Uh, thanks, Terry, thanks to Jason. Uh, for this, and uh, we'll uh, I'll uh, probably uh, stop recording at this point, and uh, so I'll just kind of throw it open to any other questions. Um, I'll hang around as long as anybody needs if they have questions, and um, we will go.